everybody. Uh, today we have Lightning Beeman that's going to be presenting by bifurcated practices, bifurcated practice, and this is a Hanyang University uh, lecture from the Department of Architecture. But as I was explaining a little bit earlier, this is open to everybody, and we want to make it more of a conversation about learning um, from, well, basically from your work and we're open to conversation and questions as we go along. So, a little bit of an introduction. Um, Lighten Beeman, uh, he's a designer, writer, and educator. He designed work research and his design work research and writing focuses on history, discourse, and speculative future of design technologies and its implications for material culture, environmental responsibility, and socially conscious design practices. Lighten is a co-founder of GAC, a design-based nonprofit working in East Africa and North America. GAC was named a design game changer by Metropolis Magazine in 2020 and has received a number of awards and recognitions for the work, including from the American Institute of Architects, Design, EDRA, and the Architectural League of New York. He's also the co-founder of Ulterior Office, a research-based multimodal design studio which works across spaces, objects, systems, and processes. The work of Ulterior Office has been featured in exhibitions and publications internationally. Lighten is an associate professor of design at Cornell University where he teaches courses in the College of Human Ecology. Prior to his appointment at Cornell, he taught at Harvard University, Rhode Island School of Design, the University of Virginia, and the University of Texas. As a writer, Lighten has contributed to a number of publications including Architectural Record, CTED, uh, two journal, Intar Journal, Issue, and Technology Architecture plus Design Journal. He's currently an editor of the International Journal of Architectural Computing. Lightning has been named a McDowell Fellow, an, Ameri uh, an American Institute of Architects Emerging Practitioner, a University of Virginia Teaching Fellow in Architecture, and was recently a visiting artist at the American Academy in Rome. He will also be presenting um, the work that he does with his partner, Sanet Long. Sanet, unfortunately, she cannot join us today, but uh, I think we can build up the conversation uh, with the work that you present as well. Uh, but also to introduce her, Sanet Long is an assistant professor in landscape architecture at Cornell University, where she teaches courses on material ecologies, landscape technologies, and sustainable practices. Prior to her arrival at Cornell, she worked at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, University of Virginia, and University of Texas at Austin. Her work has been recognized by the Grant Foundation Environmental Design Research Association, and she was recently awarded the 2018-2019 Garden Club of American Rome Prize Fellowship, a McDowell Fellowship, and Certificate of Teaching Excellence by the Derek Bach Center. Her ongoing research has appeared in numerous publications, including Innovations in Landscape Architecture, Leading Systems, Innovative Materials and Technologies for Landscape Architecture, International Journal of Interior Architecture and Spatial Design, and Journal of the Landscape Architecture. In addition to teaching, Zanetta is a co-director of Interior Office and a research and design consultant for GA Collaborative. Uh, before I say further ado, uh, go ahead and start. Um, from this introduction, it was, uh, I don't want to say difficult to pinpoint what you guys do to explain to my students uh, when, they, when they would ask, oh, what do, what do they do? And then I say GA Collaborative, Ulterior Office, and then all the work that you guys do at your lab. And one thing that I've always uh, seen from your work that I want to say uh, was mentioned in the intro, but um, I want to see if this plays out with what you present is, I feel like you guys focus on understanding the material logic and then from there build up uh, systems that form contemporary practices. Uh, this being in, in a human sense, a technologically se uh, operative sense, or all these other di different dimensions. But I think, or my understanding of when I see your work is that it, it somehow feels like it starts from the material logic first and then it evolves to these other systems. So I wanna see, again, this was a hypothesis I, 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 I've always had, but I wanna see if this plays out and then hopefully we can build a conversation around it. So 
without further ado, Lightning Demon. Thank you. And thank you for the um, great introduction and, the, and most importantly, the invitation. It's, it's a real honor to be able to share some work with you. And I think, you know, I think you're right. Um, but we'll touch on that a little bit, um, and some of it explicitly so, but um, definitely we are interested in materials, materiality, and all its different dimensions of, of expression, um, from, from the tactile to the, um, to, to the data centric, let's say, <laughs> let's say. Um, so let's see. Let's see if we can share this. All right, can you see this okay? Yes. All right. So I'm just gonna move a few things out of the way so I can see what I'm looking at. Okay, well, um, yeah, like I was saying, um, th thank you for the invitation. Um, the, you know, I was hoping to treat this because it's a it's a lengthy um, a time that I have, and usually when you rep when you present work, you don't have such um, such a so much time to be able to to speak about the work. I decided to um, sort of meander through a few projects and talk about a few things that link them together, uh, but also um, you know welcome um, everyone joining to ask questions as we go, uh, rather than waiting to the end. Um, and maybe, Rafael, if you might help manage that, I don't know. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, everybody, if you want to just ask your question through the chat, and then uh, we can also do that. If you don't want to interrupt the conversation, you can just type in your question, and then we'll bring it in as, as we go along. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, so um, I. So in the spirit of having a sort of loose and informal conversation, um, I decided to talk today about this idea, idea of bifurcated practice or a split practice. Um, and it's very much something that is in the background of our thinking as um, Zanetta and I work on projects together and even separately. Um, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit about what that means. Um, so yeah, I'll just sort of jump in. I, I will say that um, Zanetta couldn't make it, as Rafael was saying, Zanetta couldn't make it tonight, but, um, but I'll talk a little bit about some of the projects we've done together, um, and then a couple, well, at least one project that she's done in her own that play a lot into, um, into our thinking about projects. So I wanted to start off with um, just forward. Okay, um, just a few words to talk about what this means, um, this idea of bifurcated practice. So practices are defined by refrains, those things that repeat, that perpetuate themselves, that resist alteration. To practice is to do and then to do again. For designers, practices involve two questions. These are what, the entities, forms, and processes that emerge and reemerge through the act of doing, and the question of how, the techniques, strategies that are employed and then deployed. Because Zanetta and I both teach, we think a lot about the relationship between teaching and practicing. Um, and it plays a lot into this idea of bifurcated practice. Uh, so design education is centered on building the capacity to create ever more informed, skilled, refined, and sophisticated answers to these two fundamental questions. In turn, design practices are built around these ca capacities and become contingent upon them. For us, or where I'd like to sort of think about this idea of um, practice that it sort of evolved in the background is um, this idea that um, what if we were to consider alternative or complementary questions, such as why, to what effect, for whom, or towards what purpose? Over the past decade, this hypothetical has helped frame and guide our work from research and experimentation to the making of processes and things Considering this question has helped us shape a bifurcated approach to practice. So this idea that the what and the how is very important in how we consider what we do. But then this question of why, um, maybe that's the one that's more important, at least for the two of us. And it's something that's evolved over time. So this, when we think about this idea of practice, we can think about it in a couple of different ways and actually take um, take a, a very somewhat antiquated um, uh, uh, view of it, which is that it has 
the possibility of being outwardly focused or inwardly focused. Uh, this is a view that um, was predominant in the early 1900s about um, within the sort of philosophy and theory of technologies. Do technologies point outwards? Do they affect the world or do they point inwards? Are they things that sort of speak to themselves and in turn are part of the world, but not necessarily focused on it? We sort of took this as a way of thinking about design. So um, on the left, the outward focused view is that design affects the world. The inward focused view is that the world affects design in some way. And that's really led us to um, think through the formation of two different offices that are very different. And I'm, I'm gonna show, show work from both of them. Um, but I think, you know, when I'm trying to think about what it is that differentiates these two offices or studios, um, I think it, has, it comes down to this idea of the focus of practice or, or the direction that a practice might tend towards. And when we ask this question of why, um, for General Architecture Collaborative, that question takes the form of um, for whom, with whom, or to what effect? And the answers to that come across um, with, with issues of social equality, environmental responsibility, cultural context, community engagement, communication and, and dissemination, inclusion and equity. And those are concerns that designers have that are, at least in our, in our estimation, are, are outward focused in some way. For ulterior office, which is much more experimental and speculative, it doesn't necessarily deal with real, real world problems in the same way that GAC does. Um, the questions are by what means, with what process or to what affect. And for us, this has led us to think through things like procedural artifacts or material effects, human machine making, information based forms, um, systems aesthetics and post human agency. So things in, in a way these two are part of two different regimes of thinking, but hopefully there's some overlaps in them. But they also satisfy two different needs for practice, I think. Um, one is one where we are part of a world and the other is where we are part of a, let's say a discipline. So I'm gonna start off by talking about um, some of the work that began maybe a little bit over a decade ago or a little less than a decade ago, I guess. Um, this is an image of a few of the hills in Rwanda. So um, GAC, which is a nonprofit um, design office, um, does most of our work in East Africa and we have an office in Rwanda. About 10 years ago, we started um, looking at small self-built houses. So this sort of house you see in the bottom of the um, image and a few at the top. We started looking at communities that were self, that were sort of basically creating self-built villages and, and small towns. So basically places that were built by the inhabitants. And part of that research had to do with our interest in um, different systems of making that um, were not necessarily Northern um, part of the global north or part of Western culture. Um, and part of it was also to understand how we might answer this first question, which is how design affects the world. One of the first things we did um, in thinking about JC, and this is back when I was teaching at the University of Texas, um, is we started to say, well, if we are interested in affecting a place through design, then we need to start to understand the place. So the first graduate study I, I ever taught um, at, at UT was one focused on Rwanda and myself and about 13, 14 students set out the first half of the semester by mapping the country. So these are, what is this, 12 out of about 140, I think maps that we made of the country. Rwanda is fairly small. If you're familiar with the US, it's about the size of the state of Maryland. So it's, um, it's um, quite mappable because, because of that size. Um, and it's actually one of the places because it has a rich, rich resources in uh, various metals and minerals. It's actually a place that has quite a lot of um, information about it in the sort of geological and historical context. 
that mapping um, became important because it allowed us to understand the country in a number of different ways from a material standpoint, from a system standpoint, from cultural standpoints, from historical standpoints, from ideas of importing and exporting of goods and services um, in a lot of different ways. And I think after that, after that um, studio, well, actually during that studio, we started working on a small project in um, the village of Masoro. This is the, uh, the first project that we built as part of JC. And this was um, designed and built by two of the co-founders of JC, um, Yutako Sho and Jamie Setzler. So they both, uh, well, we all went to Rwanda a couple of different times to, um, and for you know months at a time to speak with different communities that we were interested in working with and to better understand the place that we were working. Um, and out of that came this initial project, which was a community built house that we helped um, fund and design and not really design in a lot of ways, but I'll talk about that in a minute. The house itself is um, fairly simple. So this is a roof plan, just a shed roof. Um, and then the, the space itself is designed around how people live in Rwanda, Rwanda, which is that they prefer to have a secure yet small living space. Um, and a lot of work and activity happens outdoors. One of the reasons for that is Rwanda has a larger change in diurnal temperature than it does in annual temperature, meaning that the temperature from morning to night changes more than it does from winter to summer. So it has a fairly consistent um, climate um, and aside from two rainy seasons, a very um, consistent sort of atmosphere, which means you can do things, you can design things in a way that you can't in the US uh, and people live in a different way. One of the things we started off with this project was because we were working with a community and we weren't quite sure um, the different um, considerations that may go into the project is we went through a process of making multiple iterations based on a few principles that we learned being there. And then also um, based on a few insights that people from the community gave us about how, um, how one might live, how a family might live, how they might work and play. And so we came up with a number of different iterations. The one at the bottom left is the one that was ultimately chosen. And this is actually part of the choosing of, of different um, things that happen in Rwanda. So you'll have uh, lines of people that, um, that form based on different votes. And this is like a common way in which communities let their voices be known. The building itself was, uh, was an attempt to introduce design education um, to a village that didn't have that as a, as a, as a resource. So in designing the house, we wanted to introduce a few basic principles from um, a standpoint of uh, formal and structural design, but then also to incorporate a few principles that were part of the, um, the way houses were made and the way people lived in the space. And then we um, wanted to also consider um, introducing ways of building that um, did not require a high learning curve or special equipment to, um, to produce. So we introduced this idea of um, earth bags and earth bags, which you can see here, are essentially a woven polypropylene bag um, that is stacked. And actually I'm gonna show a video. So in this video is, um, is a few people working with, with earth bag construction. The earth bags are um, stacked, as you can see here, uh, but they're essentially a sack that has a membrane that connects to sort of two tubes that, um, that can be filled with local dirt, soil, um, clay, sometimes a little bit of a cement, depending on um, what the composition of the soil is made of. And then it's stacked um, plastered over on two sides. Uh, we also use chicken wire and a few other materials to st stabilize them. But for the most part, the, what, this, what this produces is a building where the majority of the material that is formed is, um, or part of the building is from the site itself. So you know, 90% of, 
of that uh, material is from the site. So in this time lapse, you're seeing the house being built over the course of about uh, two weeks, where the, the the main walls that are being produced. <clears throat> so I think uh, this would be my first question. Sorry to interrupt, yeah. but um, is this a vernacular? form of construction or is this something that you guys uh, elaborated as a way of introducing a system of construction that would be easy to apply and learn yeah yeah this is a this this is something we introduced at least at, at domestic scale uh, earth bags is is a technology it's, a, it's essentially like a engineered sandbag uh, but it's a technology used by uh, initially from our research used by the u.s military to create um, bunkers and forts and things like that. When we introduced this technique uh, to Rwanda, we um, got the bags from a manufacturer in South Africa. So at the time, that was the only place producing them on the continent. Um, so we, we had those imported in. Um, some of the steel is also imported into Rwanda. But for the most part, uh, the material that's filling them and everything going on top is produced there, either on site or nearby. Um, since then, a number of companies have started using this as a building technique, um, building technology. So there's a company in Uganda, which is just to the north of Rwanda, north east kind of, um, which uh, produces a version of these, uh, slightly different than this. And, um, and we've, we've worked with them a little bit. Um, we've also introduced, so we've built a couple of houses with this technique, um, but we've also been sort of looking at other building techniques as well. There are a number of earth bag buildings built in the U.S. Um, and actually all over the all over the world. So it's not necessarily new technology, but it was new to the U.S. I mean, sorry, to, to Rwanda. To, okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you. So um, can you see here in the section that the um, like the building itself is actually very simple? It has a shed roof. It's basically a roof that is has a slope in one direction. And then some of the stabilization of the earth and the foundations were also used, um, also used earth bags. And this is sort of a breakdown of how that works. So the bag itself is a sort of a barbell shape and then um, it's filled, stacked, and then the space between it is also stacked with the same, um, the same recipe of soil, cement, sand, water. Um, and that sort of helps these to be locked together. Um, that's covered with a thin uh, piece of chicken wire on the outside, or basically a metal mesh, metal wire mesh, which allows us to then apply a cement and clay um, surface on the outside to protect the earth bags. The earth bags, one vulnerability, uh, because it's made out of polypropylene, is UV light, so it has to be covered, uh, especially on the outside. So you can sort of see how that construction is happening there. If they're filled, uh, the earth bags can be filled with cement to create lentils or other structural elements like here. So we really tried to um, experiment with, with the earth bag itself to think about how it could be used in a lot of different ways. The other thing we wanted to do um, is you'll notice there's a number of metal um, doors and um, structures that, that sort of wrap the building in a few places. And the reason we did that is we wanted to be able to infill a lot of the surfaces of the building with, um, with woven, um, with sort of a woven infill. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that in Rwanda, um, women are not typically part of the construction industry, but, but at the time we were working with women's groups um, in Mosoro. And we wanted to make sure that they were involved. They wanted to be involved. And one of the sort of stumbling box, blocks of that was that it wasn't necessarily accepted as a, as a profession or as a, as, as a way of doing things. So we sort of thought about, well, what are some of the ways that people are making things there already? And how can we begin to incorporate that or architecturalize that in some way? And so one of those was this idea of weaving, uh, which was very prominent in, the, in this village um, at a number of different scales, not at the architectural scale. Um, and so in doing that, we introduced a number of screens and doors and other frameworks that could be woven in as infills to create security, to shade from sun, to, um, to sort of obscure views into the space, but that were not necessarily architectural to begin with. We also began working with students, um, lo local students to think through um, the design 
of what these screens might be. We, these are actually, what's really interesting is many of these became employees of ours, are still employees of ours in Rwanda. So here you can see a number of different uh, processes for weaving, um, local jute and other, um, other materials into a screening system that fit into this framework. Um, one of the things we also did along with this and sort of as a side or sort of grew out of this project is the cooperative we worked with to help produce some of these woven surfaces. We ended up um, working with them later to help them build a, an artist studio so that they could work in, in part of that. This is part of a, a larger um, project that we did with um, the company Kate Spade, who, um, who uses a lot of the products that are purchased a lot of products from this, from this cooperative and actually helped fund the building of the studio. So for us, this was really interesting because it was a way of understanding the materials, the techniques, the traditions of a, of a local place and to rethink how they might, might affect architecture in that way. This has then been expanded more recently uh, with a collaboration with Autodesk. So um, we've been thinking with them through ways in which we might automate a, a testing process of different structural, structural weaving assemblies to think, to think through ways in which architecture might be less and less part of this sort of heavy, massive um, infrastructure and might utilize these, these techniques more. The idea being that we could test out multiple different iterations of ideas here in the US and then take, take those results back to Rwanda and then test them in the real world um, with people that actually know what they're doing as, as opposed to us, let's say, and see how those two things sort of mesh together. Um, this grew out of some of our interests, sort of side interest in uh, thinking through how we work with machines. This is a image of a, a study I did a while back where we were teaching a robotic arm an alphabet and then having it write different um, different sentences or or paragraphs that were already written by someone else in its own in its own method of making movements so we get um, things like this which are kind of interesting um, but that that sort of interest this sort of side interest into into the ways in which technologies shape practices um, has sort of been folded into the things we do with GAC thinking through um, these sort of structural woven systems and then working with Autodesk to test those out. The pandemic has sort of put a hold on a lot of that research, but that should be starting up um, in the fall, I'm sorry, in the spring again, or at least the summer. Um, so in the meantime, part of that research was just done by hand without, um, without robots, but um, using um, procedural logics. So ways in which you would move through um, different structural forms and thinking through the technique of weaving through those. So these are some of the early tests we did. And then to um, test those by 3D printing those structures. So uh, what's interesting about these is that um, they're only partially, these, these woven pieces are only partially connected to one another. They're actually quite flexible, even though it's a rigid 3D print. And it's because they're not, um, not all pieces are connected to all other pieces. They, they actually follow the logic of a, of a weave where you have two pieces that cross over each other and there's a point of connection between those. So just thinking through um, what that process might be like and then sort of doing what we could to test them here um, at a much smaller scale, but test some of those principles. This in turn became um, something that we brought to the University of Virginia as a research studio we started thinking about um, not so much the structural integrity of this process because we couldn't build things at that scale, but um, the sort of form making um, process and how different forms or different methods of weaving produce different types of forms or different spaces. So these are some of the work that the students did. And then to sort of catalog that as a procedure. So something we could teach someone else, whether that be another person or something we could codify into a algorithm or a sequence that we could then teach a computer or a program to do. And then lastly, to start to apply that to come up with different formal logics that might be based on this woven technology. So there's an interesting thread that, cut, that cuts through a, th a few of these projects, even though they look quite different. Um, 
and it has a lot to do with the process of assembly um, that we learned by being introduced to a, a different culture and a different way of thinking about space. Um, one of the things we didn't tackle with this as much is um, the materiality of these studies, um, but it's something that, as um, Raphael noted, that flows through a lot of our work. Uh, most notably, one of the early uh, processes of this, and this is a project that Zanetta did um, at the University of Texas, was, um, was thinking through materials um, in a few different ways and how we might as designers sort of customize the, um, the interface or the way in which information about materials is exchanged. So Zanetta had started working with uh, materials um, at Harvard and again here at UT. She was the director of the materials lab for a few years. And her, um, her goal and what she was succeeded in doing was to rethink the way in which that interaction happens, both spatially, uh, but also sort of as an interface. This is part of the materials lab, um, which is basically a, almost like a library, materials library. So the first thing she did when getting, getting there was to build a cataloging system that allowed um, you to think through materials in ways that designers use them, right? So we think about them as far as their composition, but also the form they might take or the processes they may go through or the properties they may have or the application, the ways in which they're applied. Um, and then she built a website that um, cataloged the thousands and thousands of materials that were already there and then brought in new materials as well. And you can sort of see some of what that interface looks like. That's actually still online. Um, she hasn't been part of it for a while, but I think it's still being filled in. And you can sort of check that out, uh, Materials Lab at um, University of Texas. The other part of this was to rethink the way in which uh, the spatial implications of of using materials in this way. So this is a plan of the space she had that was part of the materials library. Uh, this is sort of an idea of what a typical day may be. But um, she broke it down into considering a number of different things that happen at, in a space like this and ways in which we interact with materials. One is this idea of documentation. So she built a lab here, this is E, where materials could be um, scanned, photographed, measured, information could be recorded about them so that they could be cataloged, but then they could also, most of that information could live online so anyone could access it. She also wanted to create a space where we could have people, practitioners, um, industry, people from industry, researchers come in and talk about the ways in which they develop or utilize materials in different ways. Um, this is not always um, necessarily part of architecture. It could be part of anything, industrial design, artists, um, jewelry makers, um, whatever the case may be. So she designed a space that could be that could be used for a lecture. She also set up an area, which is essentially like a workshop. So you could bring in materials, you could check out different materials and actually use them, have demonstrations about different ways in which they may be used or applied or manipulated. Um, it also created in this lecture space, a gallery so that projects that were using materials in interesting ways could be showcased. And then there was a learning lab at the back so that we could actually teach um, both D and F were spaces where you could teach courses on this. And I actually taught two courses in that space during my time at the University of Texas. The other um, thing we wanted or she wanted to do with this was to consider the way in which we catalog materials. Um, so there is a, a currently a number of different methods. Um, CSI is the main way that that's done. Um, so she organized the um, library in such a way that you could um, sort of understand the way industries catalog and use materials or understand materials um, through the spatialization of that, of that library space. And then to sort of create um, this sort of system of moving parts where you could interchange pieces that fit into this, um, into this system, you know, from storage or some, some other place. So the idea being that it's, it's almost like a gallery in the sense that there's, you know, let's say 50,000 pieces that you have, but at, at any one time, maybe 25,000 of them are on display. So as you came back to the library, new things would, would emerge. Obviously you could check out things 
in storage or on display here. So this idea of um, thinking about materials as being something other than an object or something other than a um, something that you might specify as a designer, actually thinking about how it performs or how it behaves or um, the ways in which it interacts with other materials or humans led us to a, a few, let's say speculative projects that we did. Um, so this is more part of the ulterior office side. Um, one of them was called reciprocal artifacts. So this was a series of um, investigations that Zanetta and I did um, a few years back where we looked at, um, she has a background in, Zanetta has a background in landscape architecture and, and um, knows plants very well and has a, put a lot of time into understanding the sort of logic behind different plant growth um, systems. Um, I'm trained as an architect, um, so I have uh, invested a lot into the spatialization of things. So we kind of wanted to bring some of those two interests together. Um, so we produced a series of these objects that borrowed um, information from both disciplines. Um, and basically they, they break up into these sort of four considerations that we looked at um, sort of branching and different ways of thinking about um, mirology or the sort of what parts belong to what other parts. Um, this idea of um, origins or um, roots of things and this idea also of edges. So how do things end themselves? And then from that, we came up with a catalog of various artifacts that we produced. Uh, what's great about this, what we were interested in, is that they, there's no purpose to these. Uh, we just did them because there was an interest there. Um, so this sort of follows a, a process of scripting, uh, but also some manual manipulation of these. So for instance, choosing an origin or a start point is something that we could do manually. Um, choosing edges that we wanted to retain versus edges that we would allow to go away is something that we could input manually, but then other things were automated. Um, and then from that, we uh, 3D printed a number of these and this became part of an exhibition of, of work. Um, and it was you know, really great and liberating in a way. It's the polar opposite of the first project that I showed, which is very much about um, real world concerns of people that don't have access to design. Um, and this is, and in, in, in such, it's a very outward looking um, use of design or, or question, set of questions for design. And this is a very inward looking one, um, questioning you know, what means we might use as architects, who becomes the author of these things um, and how they reside in the world in some way. Um, this has also led to a number of let's say hybrid uh, projects, ones that rely on these techniques I just talked about or these ways of thinking, but that also then go back out into the world in some way. So this is an installation that we did at the University of Cincinnati, uh, which uses laminated, um, laminated uh, materials to create lightweight structures. Um, there's sort of a whole process that, that is built off of this idea of an origin and a system of growth and articulation. Um, and that is then coupled with um, this idea of a body and how a body might interact with the space, thinking of where your head is, where your arms are, where your legs are, and where they might most, um, I guess, most likely interact with a, with a space. And then from that, um, sort of combining those two considerations together, we came up with uh, a, essentially an infinite number of different objects and decided to build one of them at full scale. So this is about six feet tall. Well, it's exactly six feet tall by three feet by three feet, or I don't know, what's that? 1.75 meters by, I don't know, you have to help me with the, with the math of that. Um, and then um, after designing the, this piece that sort of interacted with the body in different ways, essentially allowing spaces to look through, to put arms and legs through, to um, shake hands with someone on the other side, for instance. Um, one of the challenges was to go through a process of automating the fabrication of this, which was, again, following back on this early idea in um, GAC, where we're considering the ways in which things are made. And here we're leveraging the computational power of a computer to 
do a lot of the trial and error parts that we might do as humans. Um, these are a number of different diagrams which just talk about the sort of testing methodology of creating, taking a form on the left and creating a series of pieces or parts that fit together and then testing them for how big they might be so they could be laser cut, um, how long or how much curvature they're being asked to bend and twist so we had an idea of how, how wide they needed to be. And then to come up with a method of assembly so we had sort of A's and B's that we put together. This in turn allowed us to think through how we might take this idea of making, uh, which is a collaborative, uh, collaborative process of making with a computer and with a machine and bring it back into education in some ways. So this is a seminar I taught at um, University of Virginia um, a year, year and a half ago now, where we looked at different methods for, for, um, for creating spaces like that. Some of them borrowed from techniques of weaving um, that we used in, in other projects. Oops. And, um, and what's interesting about this is that, uh, you know, we, one of the goals that we have with this is to make everything out of fairly cheap materials and readily available materials. So these are all made out of paper. And then to produce a number of these um, pieces, which are about six feet tall out of, out of white paper. So um, the art know, stuff these or? weigh, I don't know, about seven, seven pounds or something, <laughs> or not even, I think. And most of that weight is from these little plastic rivets. Um, Okay, so that brings us back to another um, JC project. So as this project was happening at school with students, uh, this project was happening in on the ground in Rwanda. This is the Masoro Health Center. And this is the first project we did, JC did, that is was not a house, essentially. So um, this was built uh, a few years ago. It's actually built in phases, so it, it com was completed last year. Um, but the health center was a project that we did um, with the help of um, some funders. So this was a, a nonprofit project that we that we helped fund, or we helped raise money to fund it. Um, and it's essentially a community center. So if we look at the um, if we look at the plan, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine buildings that we worked on. There's an existing building up here on the site. Um, you can see on the left, this is sort of a section through the, through a large part of the site. So like a, almost um, almost a kilometer through the site. So we're just we're just in a little piece kind of in the middle, but it's, it's fairly steep. Um, and on that site, there was a maternity ward, which is this building here. And then there were these two buildings, which were partially destroyed um, by lightning a few years ago. Uh, so we took these two, buildings and decided to, um, with this project, decided to think how, think about how we might create a campus or a project for a health center as opposed to a hospital or some other building. And the reason we thought, of, we thought through this is um, that in Rwanda, and, and it's not so different than the US and may actually be very similar in Korea, I, I don't know, but there are stigmatisms about um, going to the hospital, right? Um, it's not the, it can be like a scary thing to do. Um, but there's also these ideas that, well, if you go to a hospital, you must be sick, there must be something wrong with you. And obviously we, we see this now, even with, with COVID-19, that there is like a lot, of, um, a lot of assumptions that are made around healthcare and people that go to health clinics. So one of the things we wanted to do was to not create a clinic, but and to in fact create a community center that just happened to be a healthcare facility as well. And so to do that, what we, what we wanted to do was basically create a campus, uh, a campus of buildings as opposed to a single building. So that meant um, renovating these two buildings and extending this one a bit. And these became uh, more um, sort of technologically advanced buildings because they had some infrastructure attached to them already. And then we created, we took a lot of the other parts of the program and basically step them down the hill. So this is the highest part here. This is the lowest part down here. And we sort of broke up the program so that it, um, it didn't seem monolithic, but also it, it sort of required you to move through the space in a lot of different ways. We then combined that with um, another number of programs that are not really part of a health clinic. So education, 
um, was one of them. Um, outreach to the community, even a community center, a space where people could um, use this to have meetings, to have a wedding, wh whatever the case may be. Uh, we also included um, spaces for performance, which also doubled as a teaching or a learning area. Um, we have, uh, we worked with a nonprofit called Gardens for Health that helped us to understand how we might um, introduce um, the cultivation of various vegetables, fruits and vegetables, and how best to prepare them to keep, um, keep the most nutrients intact or to preserve them so that they lasted throughout multiple seasons. Um, so, the, so this project really became a question about how do you create a community center out of a health clinic? And then in, in doing this, we sort of, like I was saying earlier, breaking up um, the program so that you sort of meandered through the space and you could come here for one purpose, but not another. Um, and so in that way, it sort of invited people from the community to use the space in a lot of different ways. So you could go here and get water. You could come here and get um, things washed. So there's like a wash basin here. Uh, there's public bathrooms, things like that. So here you're looking at this sort of basic entry space, uh, which is pretty much open to the public. This is where ambulances come through. Um, and then um, these two blue roof buildings are the ones that were renovated. And then everything with a red roof is, is new. One of the things we wanted to do with this, just like the houses, is we employed a lot of local um, villagers to help build the project. And in doing so, um, we considered how this might be a opportunity to teach um, building. So each of the red buildings has a different roof um, a different roof design and a different, slightly different structural technique. They all do different things as far as letting in light or ventilation. And it basically creates a catalog of different ways in which one might create a roof. Um, we also um, introduced or didn't introduce, but we also sort of experimented with various load bearing um, brick walls. So typically in the US, you can't build brick walls that are load bearing, basically that have all the, that hold all the structure of the building. But in Rwanda, you can't. Um, so we sort of investigated various ways of doing that and, and introduced that as another, as another opportunity to teach um, the people that we had hired um, ways in which they could build. And aside from that, the building is broken up into a couple of, all the buildings are broken up into a couple of parts. Um, the first is this layer of stone, which you're seeing here, which um, serves as retaining walls as the building steps down the hill. The second um, layer is that of brick. So you can, you can kind of make it out here. There's a sort of diagonal pattern that's happening. And that is a um, pattern that allows us to create a structural connection between multiple layers of brick. And it also allowed us to create formwork inside the brick walls. So this concrete that you're seeing here that's spanning, these are all formed inside the walls with just one layer of, of plywood on the outside um, to sort of secure, secure that formwork. So there's a couple of there's a couple of structural things happening here, and then, like I said earlier, the um, the various roof typologies that are created. So it's basically three parts layered one on top of the other that introduce three different um, ways of thinking about building in Rwanda. And then aside from that, um, there's a lot of covered spaces that are not um, air conditioned or heat or anything because again, because of the climate that's there. Here we have two of uh, two of the employee or three of the employees looking at or sort of experimenting with this different um, load bearing brick technique. And then stepping up the landscape, we have, um, as I mentioned earlier, these different gardens that um, are cultivating various uh, vegetables and fruits that can be used um, for, um, for subsistence farming. It, are, the, are, the, few. are the people that help you out, you say that Originally, they're locals, and then they start joining GAC. But they do so, not have any architectural training, right? Yeah, so um, so when we did the first house, the, the group that built that house, they formed a cooperative themselves and then went out and started building other houses, right, with, without us. And in many ways, this was our, this is a goal of ours with GAC, is to not, is to eventually leave, right? <laughs> like. We, we don't want to build, this is something that's, that's very much part of the discussion around nonprofits. It's, it's one of the things you do not want to do as a nonprofit is 
especially if you're going into a place that's not your own community is you don't want to build dependency, right? You don't want to have a situation where after you leave, no one can do anything with, with, you know, no one can continue building things or maintaining things because they don't have the knowledge that you have about how this is done. So from the beginning, our goal was to uh, work with the communities that we had projects with and introduce training education as, as one of those different aspects. So in this project, um, it's a, it's a hybrid. Go back. So these guys stone um, structure stone is uh, so we as JC were essentially the general contractors for the project as well. And we worked with this local uh, masonry builder called structure stone and they were the sort of local expertise. And then they would help us to train. And that's kind of what one of these images is Yeah, here. They would help train um, locals in different masonry techniques. And then we would intro introduce various patterns or allocations of masonry to create different conditions, right? So it was a, it was a sort of a joint, a joint effort. We're, we're not masons ourselves, obviously. So, we, you know, those, the, the basics of how you do that is not something we have much skill at. So we sort of had to partner up with that. So the idea then is that at the end of this project, we have, I don't know, like 25, 50 people that now know the construction industry to a certain degree. And in fact, uh, I'll show a project later um, where we hired a lot of these same people for that project. Cause now we know that they know how to build stuff and they know how to build stuff that we, that have details and stuff that we like, or we know will work. And so now they become, they can become, you know, general contractors or construction workers or whatever the case may be. And I think the other part of this is that, you know, in building a community center, this was sort of beyond the scope of the project, right? So we needed people from the community to be there as we were making decisions about, okay, so what, what should we do here? How, do you, how would you use this space? Or what kind of spaces do you need? Or, or you know, what, what happens day to day in this village that we could make a space for or provide a facility for or whatever the case is. And, and so that, that kind of being on the ground is, is invaluable. And I have to say this is, so much of this is um, all because of, um, uh, one of the founding partners, um, James Setzler, who basically, I guess at this point, five years ago, just picked up from the US and moved there and started and just started running the office because I'm teaching, Zanetta's teaching, Yutaka, who teaches at Syracuse University, um, who's also very, um, you know, very much responsible for this project. Um, we're, we're all here in the US nine months, 10 months out of the year. So it's hard to, to see projects through unless you have an office there. So then this is um, sort of part of the strategy of thinking about how you mitigate um, the, the landscape. So part of it is to sort of, again, stepping down the buildings, but also introducing things like this, like um, this sort of um, diagonal planting pattern on the hills that are nearby. Um, the idea being that as these plants take root, the root system helps stabilize the soil. So, we're thinking about uh, not only how do we, you know, structure a space uh, or stru structure a building using brick and concrete, but how do we prevent and, and sort of using stone to mitigate that, the difference in topography, but how do we start to use plants and um, land forming, things like that to also mitigate that erosion and, um, and yeah, and, and, and the terrain. Um, the last thing I'll talk about with this project is um, one of the things we realized when um, when we hired people uh, locally was that people would work through lunch because they were getting paid by the hour, and there's and unemployment's pretty high, especially in rural areas, um, and so they would work through lunch and not eat, and they were tired, or they would get sick. So we started, and this is one of the great things about being a nonprofit is that you are not only uh, sort of in charge of de designing the project, but also helping to implement it. So we were able to use some funds to help pay for lunches for everyone there. So this was another opportunity to now hire other people in the in the village who didn't necessarily want to work in construction, but wanted to cook, right? So we could hire people to be cooks and to help um, feed everyone, that, all these people that were working on the project. And would they get... That, uh... Would they see it as a break or they were ex 
still expecting to get paid for that time that they would eat or, or how did you break that? Well, I think, that notion? Yeah, I think it wasn't so much the break. I think it was that, you know, they're not at home. So they have to go, they'd have to go into the village and buy food or something, okay. right? And people didn't, people didn't really want to do that. So well, as long and, as yeah, you can I mean, bring the food to them, then they could take the time to eat and right, just right. a little bit and then get back to work. And they weren't using their pay, their salary to do that, which was which was part of the key. So in the end, I think what, what we learned is that, you know, the building is, or the landscape is like one part of it. And, you know, if you're an architect, then that's, that's a lot of what you do because there are other people and other entities that are responsible for other parts. But as a nonprofit, when you're kind of um, thinking about the project in a more holistic way, because you're kind of in charge of funding and you're in charge of like, you know, how you might, um, talk about it to a lot of different people outside of architecture, you realize that there's also here an opportunity to think about the building or des design the process outside of the building. Like, what are the logistics of it? What, how, what materials are we choosing? Where are they coming from within Rwanda? Who are we hiring to build this? How are, how are they getting paid? How are we ensuring that it's safe or that they're fed, things like that. So um, the, the sort of the scope of the design project just started to expand bigger and bigger and bigger. And we're taking on, we're considering things, um, you know, outside the building, but still thinking through them in a sort of a design process in a way, which was, which was pretty interesting. So one of the other things that we've done um, that I think um, for us has been really exciting is to go and then talk about some of this work to other people. So whether it's um, an exhibition in Germany or um, last year, the Biennale in Seoul, where we had a, a small sort of board of some of these and, and videos. Um, I think that's been really interesting for us. And one of the out, outport, outputs of that is we've been able to work with a couple of interesting people, filmmakers, um, and also this person, Amaji, who is a who is a rap star in Rwanda. And let me see if I can. So one of the things he did um, with us was to create a, a rap song and then eventually a video about um, a, trying to like teach people about how they can be involved in building their own environment, right? Um, so you're seeing some of the um, you're seeing some of the uh, translation at the bottom, but um, it's really interesting. So most of this most of these images are filmed in Kigali. So this is where our office is. Um, this is the, the capital and the, the, by far the largest city. Um, and then there's some, there's some shots of some of the projects we worked on um, outside in the more rural areas. Uh, but, you know, really exciting. How, do, how many times do you get to, you know, to be part of a rap video if you're, <laughs> if you're a designer, right? So, so it's, it's an interesting, interesting thing, but I think that, that, that came out of this idea of if we're gonna work with communities, um, we need to really start to understand the context we're working with, and we need others to help us with that. So if it's a filmmaker, if it's a musician, if it's an artist, if it's a politician, these are all, these are all part of the, uh, that bigger scope I'm talking about. That's, the, that's a part of getting things done, making things built, having people in control, or having some have a voice in building their own environment. Um, okay, so let me go back. Okay, um, yeah, I guess, do, do you guys, do you, does, does anyone need to take a break or would you like to keep going? What? Keep, keep going? Okay, okay. Okay, so um, with that, the Masoro Health Center, um, we really started to think about, and, and this goes back to this idea of why, like why, why are we designing? Um, why, are we, why are we architects? Why are we landscape architects? What do we do to the world? Or what, you know, how do we contribute to the world? And the Masoro Health Center was very much about understanding what it, what it is to contribute to a community. Um, so it, it sort of went beyond just getting tested for tuberculosis or getting um, you know, dental checkups and things like that. It became like understanding what it means to be part of a community. 
So this next project is one that I did with um, Melissa Goldman, who is the um, fabrications manager at UVA, and then Andrew Cutlass, who is the, is the head of Matsys, who, who many of you may have seen uh, his work before, does a lot of really beautiful um, projects um, that deal a lot with fabrication and materials. The three of us um, wanted to do a project together at, uh, at UVA, and we decided to turn it into, or it was sort of, it, it came up as an opportunity to do a, a course. Um, and you're seeing part of it in the background back here, which I'll talk about. So the University of Virginia um, was uh, founded by Thomas Jefferson, who also designed this, um, the, the sort of original campus, which you're seeing here. And this is called the lawn, which is essentially a, 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 grass, a grassy lawn that sort of steps down. There's a slight um, stepping down the landscape. Um, and it's built around a couple of key parts. There's this rotunda, which is sort of at the time was the main, sort of the main building in the library. And then all these pavilions, which are these like houses that you're seeing here, which served as um, the, the classrooms for each of the disciplines of the school. And then this colonnade in between them, which is where all the students lived. And there's actually another row of them in the back, back here. So there, there's a lot of controversy about Thomas Jefferson, which I won't get into so much here uh, because I'm gonna get into a different controversy. So um, when I first started at the University of Virginia it was 20, uh, 2017. Um, this is sort of, when I first got there, this is what you see of the lawn, this is that big rotunda. And not long after I got there, this is what you saw of the lawn. So as many of you may know, there was uh, a number of white supremacist um, marches and rallies that happened at the university or in Charlottesville, which is the town and at the University of Virginia. Um, this coincided with the, um, the first year of the Trump administration. Um, and you're seeing a picture here of them with torches and screaming and yelling and basically um, promoting uh, white supremacy, right? Um, this is the same lawn uh, the next day. So this is thousands of students and faculty and staff and people from the community that came out and wanted to show that this is not what this community is about. So um, here we're seeing a sort of aerial view of the lawn um, after a few months after all of this happened. Um, and you're seeing the pavilion that I'll talk about over here on the, on the left. Um, <clears throat> and I just want to show you this as a sort of to give you sort of an idea of the context of the space that we were working in. So, you know, this, this happened, um, so this happened a couple of days before classes started, this, this, you know, a day or two later, and then all of a sudden we're starting classes. And we were gonna do this project where we wanted to um, introduce some, some methods of computational design and um, some ideas of materials and fabrication techniques into a seminar. And we wanted the seminar to be open to everyone at the university. Um, so we had people from the drama department. We had a uh, we had a um, statistical. Uh, what, what was her? What was her? I can't remember this. This one girl's um, this one student's degree was in like statistical engineering or something. Something I have never heard of before. But she was a genius. Um, anyway, we had just a random group of people along with some architects and landscape architects. And the first, you know, we had this sort of intensive first week. Um, but it was like, we had class every day because Andrew could only be there a few days. Um, and we basically asked students, what did they want to do for this project? And, and it was sort of unanimous that they wanted to um, make something that sort of took back that lawn space from, from the protest, protest that had happened there earlier. And we sort of decided that, um, you know, you have these pavilions that you're seeing here and they're, they're called pavilions that, that face the lawn. And we wanted to create a, a different type of pavilion, one that is open, that is not behind doors, that didn't feel like it belonged to anyone except for whoever just stumbled upon it. One of the issues with the University of Virginia or the space in particular is that a lot of people in the community um, that are not part of the university don't feel that this, even though this is a public space and open to anyone, they don't feel that they're really allowed there um, because it's, it's sort of part of an institution. It's part of a different worldview in many ways. 
So we decided to sort of take, take over some of that space. So there was a bit of a lengthy process of getting approval for this, but in doing so, we wanted to create something that was, that made it more welcoming, made it more um, a novelty to come see and experience. Um, so we started looking at um, the formal logic of the lawn, so the different pavilions, um, the sort of stepping down of the landscape, how it relates to this rotunda, and sort of think about how we might um, create something that both extended and thought about the, the logic of the space, but that was very different and, and presented a different way of thinking about an architectural space. In doing that, we went through a process of um, first teaching a few different scripting methods for form finding and then to um, create, because we had a lot of different students in the class, create a method so that everyone had an opportunity to contribute to the form, the structural, the, the form making, the sort of structural logic of this thing that we we're making. And at some point, and I don't know exactly how this happened, we came up with these like legged things that, that started to emerge. Um, and these are a few of them, there's hundreds of them. Um, and then from that, we decided to create um, four, each with a different size and a different level of complexity. Um, and in this process to think about, okay, how is it gonna be made and what's the logic of its construction? Because there's a, there, was another, there was another idea that was floating around among students, which is that they wanted to involve as many people as possible in the, in the making of it. So in the end, we came up with these, um, these four objects, these sort of like animal objects that sort of essentially loosely formed a circle um, and created a space for people to gather and move through people with different sizes and shapes to move through. Some were sort of more attuned to the size of children. Others had um, more complex interactions of spaces. And overall, they were about say, 43 feet long and about 14, 15 feet tall. And one of the things we did was um, in the process of fabricating this is we made a series of um, how-to manuals. So this is one for the largest one here, so the extra large object. Um, and we just went through and made a manual to describe how you would assemble this out of a number of pieces of um, polypropylene. And then how each of um, these parts, so how, do they, how they go together as a detail and then how each of the parts collected. So all, um, all these sort of arch spaces and how they collected into different sections and then how they created a seam between them and then use that as a way of getting people on campus and in the community to become part of the process of making it. So for, for weeks, we had people coming out here and assembling these pieces. And then eventually we took them all out onto the space and sort of propped them up and seamed them together so that we created a, a space out of them. So this is sort of two of the legs that you're seeing that were made out of this. So, for us, this was quite interesting because we had conceived of this um, project as being a way of introducing more advanced computational methods, um, ways of building with robotics or CNC um, techniques, because these are things that all three of us were interested in and wanted to introduce more formally at the University of Virginia. And in the end, what it became was this sort of community build uh, project that um, in the end, sort of resided there on the lawn for a little while and became a space for people to, um, to collect. And, and in a way, it became a bit of a landmark there for a while. The, um, the guy I said earlier, we had a, a student that was in drama. He came up with this, uh, he was very much interested in, in lighting. So he came up with this, in, this lighting scheme um, for the piece. So these were all on sensors and we could change the sort of lighting of this um, throughout the day and at night. And, with different activities. The, the, um, the project was all built out of um, eighth inch thick polypropylene, which is a translucent and very flexible plastic. Uh, but that translucency was great because it allowed us to sort of um, create these, these amazing color schemes that, that, um, that emerged. These, um, that project is part of a sort of an ongoing interest I have um, and Zanetta to it uh, in a different way um, that deals with um, the processes, these different processes of assembly and, um, and making that are 
collaborative with various machines. So this is an installation, a couple of different installations we've done. This one's at the American Institute of Architects in Washington. Um, there's one we did at the University of Texas with students that still get at this idea of how do we, um, how do we find form with computational methods? And then how do we then leverage that, um, those techniques or those capabilities to help us in the, in the fabrication and assembly process. Um, and this has also become part of a number of courses I've taught um, at, uh, at RISD, at Virginia, and in Texas that sort of deal with this idea of how we might think through materials and assembly processes and how we have now become very much collaborators with various machines, whether they're computers, CNC manufacturing techniques. I mean, in many ways, even our exacto knife is a collaborator because it forces us or it encourages us to make things in certain ways. So whether it's the sort of robotics or the things that are more hand handheld, I think that's quite interesting. And, and in fact, this is where this is sort of where a lot of my own interests go back into JC, which is this, um, which is understanding how we make things intuitively and by hand, and how we translate that way of thinking and making to things that are not human. So here you're seeing a few examples of, um, of projects that I've done with students or little tests of things that are all about this idea of making. Um, some of these are from the same course, so seeing different sort of structural techniques and modes of, modes of assembly. So this is something that I've done in my own, in my own work and my own research, but also something I do with students. And we've also started extending that to larger scale um, ideas of making, so such as land landforming or large scale um, manipulations of topography. So these are again another another set of studies that um, some students of mine did uh, for studio. So this is like early early in the studio um, where they're sort of experimenting with some of these techniques. Now we but use some this of is, these. Is this looking into? landscape architecture or just landforming in general? I think yes to both. It's um, this, this specific set, and there's a, this one here is a little bit bigger, is looking into methods of landforming that are informed by uh, natural systems, then simulating those so that we um, can consider like erosion as a collaborative method of landforming, for instance. Um, so that's what a lot of these were looking at, um, but then like using that um, in in more landscape scaled applications, right? So um, so these are these are sort of tests that students did, but then thinking about them and other projects. And this is actually something that's come in um, come into play in a lot of the JC projects. I don't have a lot of drawings to to show those, but we actually do on occasion have. Um, have gone through and used some of these computational processes to think about how we might mitigate um, topographical changes in Rwanda. So uh, that, for, I don't know if you remember, it seems like a long time ago, but that very first image I showed of Rwanda with all the hills, uh, it, it is a very topographically challenging place to work. Um, so, so some of this has come into play, not, not always explicitly like this, but um, in a more, a way of sort of informing how we might build uh, on a topography. Uh, so, so that plus this idea of, of these sort of modular construction methods and the, the repetition of units with variation, um, which is, it is very common in, in a lot of architecture for the last 20 years, let's say, or even before, but certainly since, um, certainly since parametric uh, methods have become very accessible. Uh, this is quite common. So um, I think what's less common is considering how they are applied in places that don't have access to robotics and 3D printers and things like that. Um, and I think that's where some of the landforming issues or interests come in. Uh, but also in projects like this. So this is another JC project. Um, this is a learning and sports center that we did. Um, it's completed the first phase. It's actually quite a large project. Um, so I'll just show you the first, the sort of the first phase of it. Um, so this is for us, a, this is the project we did after the health center. And 
Uh, it's a very interesting one in the sense that, um, let's see if I can find a, so here we go as a site plan. Um, so this project has, was based off of this soccer field, which is basically, it wasn't even really a soccer field. It's just one of the few flat or relatively level pieces of land in this whole region that we're working in. So with all the, the hills and uh, mountains and everything, there's just, there's nowhere to play soccer. And everyone loves soccer in Rwanda, right? Or football in Rwanda. So this is an extremely popular site. And it was, um, it was owned by a nonprofit that was interested in um, combining a sports league with uh, education. And their, their idea was that, okay, if we build a sports, everyone plays, plays football here all the time. If we were to formalize that into different leagues, you know, for kids, adults, whatever, and combine that with what their mission was, which was, you know, um, educating people that had either dropped out of school or continuing education to learn, you know, everything from accounting to yoga or whatever the case may be. Um, so their idea was to combine these two things, right? So take this popular thing of football and say, okay, if you want to play football, that's great, but you have to take a class in accounting or you have to take a class in um, like a, st a STEM class or something like that, right? So um, we started working with them on how to, how to do this. And um, so we came up with this project. So this is sort of phase one of the project, which is a, a learning and sports center. Um, the project has a number of different components um, that have nothing to do with football, right? So uh, this building here is a learning center and library. Um, it has like uh, an area for children, um, has book stacks, things like that. Um, outside of that, in this sort of gray area here is essentially a theater. And then there's seating on this side and then it slopes back down on the other side. This was something designed by um, the students that we had hired from um, Kigali University or Rwanda University, sorry. Uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, so it's essentially a place to have um, plays or uh, lectures or announcements. It's mostly open air. Um, so that's sort of the educational, um, sort of the more public educational piece. There's an outdoor classroom here. So just an outdoor space uh, for classes. There is this IT building. So this is where, I'm uh, sorry, the, the, the classroom building. So these are, um, this is a sort of multifunction space where you set up for different smaller classes. And then you have a computer or an IT um, pavilion, which has um, training. This is something they, they sort of um, started working with edX, which I think was started by Harvard and Stanford, which provides online learning. So here um, there's computers available. You can, you can actually go here and learn coding in Python or you know, a, a lot of different languages. Um, and then, and then it gets more into the sports side. So we have in this building, there's some offices and a concession stand. Here there's locker rooms, um, there's a storage space. And then there's this large space here that can be divided into multiple smaller rooms. And this is for lectures or dance classes, things like that. Uh, basketball court here, and then the soccer field at the bottom. So that sort of rounds out this bottom, this bottom half of the project. And then it, it sort of goes up from there with um, things that'll hopefully happen in the future as more funding, we get more funding. So this is the site, um, the soccer field. I'm basically, well, this photograph is taken a little bit in front of the soccer field. So it's kind of behind, behind the camera in this. And then this is sort of where the, the facility is built. One of the other things that's interesting about this site is that it used to be a copper mine. So back, Sort of back in here, um, there's these big um, sort of quarried out spaces and, and caves for copper mining. It's, it's been abandoned, but because it used to be a mine and used to be quite profitable, uh, I think it was government owned. Um, it's one of the few places in this whole region that has access to electricity. So they actually brought electrical power lines onto the top of this mountain um, to help run the equipment and everything. And the lines are still there. So um, having, an IT classroom is actually possible, whereas most of, most of the area around does not have access to electricity, this, this place does. And you're seeing some of the leftover um, houses that were built in the 1960s for the people that ran, um, the, people that ran the, uh, the mine. So this is just some of the images of us starting in the building process. 
again, we're using, in this case, we're using a lot of the same people from the, because the, it's, it's in roughly the same region. So um, we're using a lot of the same employees, same people we, we helped train, um, you know, a year earlier in the, in the health center project. The difference is this time we're working with a, um, a Swiss uh, research group um, who has developed a series of um, modern or modified brick um, shapes and technologies so that you can build um, these load bearing bricks or load bearing walls with very little mortar. Um, and, and it's just a, it's sort of a more efficient, efficient way of building with load bearing brick. So this is the project as it's starting to take shape. I'm using these modified, um, this, this modified brick system. And then this is, these are some of the, still under construction, but some of the early um, images of some of the interiors. So um, again, the, what's great about these, this brick system is that they're um, fired in such a way that they become quite smooth and, and really usable for interior and exterior applications. One of the things about building in Rwanda is that it's unlike in the US, and I compare it to the US because that's most of our, my work prior to working here, um, there's just a different level of um, finishes that are required. Um, so things are a lot more bare, like the materials that you use to build or the materials that you see on the inside, they, they don't, there's not a lot of stuff that's covered up, um, or if it is, it's done for other reasons. So we use a lot of the uh, woven reed screens for ceilings and other areas to help with acoustics and things like that. But, um, but they're not really necessarily covering up much of anything, like typically what's behind there, which would be metal or in this case, um, concrete um, would, be, would be exposed. Um, this is that central court space and, the, and this is that outdoor classroom here. I think I have another, yeah, here's a picture of the outdoor classroom. So um, this ended up being a, a, a pivotal project. Um, it was, this first phase was roughly completed in, in March, um, right when the pandemic was hit, was, um, was happening. Um, before even books and everything could come in to the space. So it was just kind of like a shell of a space. It, it sort of got, we, we sort of started using it um, as a place to provide um, information about the pandemic, best practices for hygiene. Um, in this case, this is a little bit prior to the pandemic. So we're, they're talking about um, water filtration systems, um, but then we'll have doctors from the clinic you know, down the road a little way, come and speak to people in, in the community about different um, different ways of protecting yourself against things. And then this became a, um, if I have a picture of, yeah, I don't have the most recent picture, but um, this became a um, testing area and a place to pick up um, masks and, and things like that, right? So we sort of, this, this is, was in the process of becoming a library. It wasn't even finished and it already became uh, uh, sort of a center for, uh, for picking up food, water, masks, getting information about testing, uh, best practices, things like that, which I think is pretty interesting. Uh, and then here you're seeing um, how an another way in which this project is used. So there's a lot of community festivals and gatherings that happened out here. This is that sort of courtyard between the library and the, um, and the offices and concession stands. And you can see that weird, crazy um, stay, um, I don't know, stair seating thing that, that students had designed. They were actually using these um, traditional uh, or, or let's say iconographic um, patterns of, um, of surface patterning that's used in Rwanda quite often. And actually th there's a number of, um, if you can find an example. Yeah, maybe not, maybe it's later, but um, they'll be used them on um, in weaving patterns on doors in windows as well, they, they come up here too. So these are prior to them being filled in with other materials. Uh, but it's sort of interesting because, you know, I, I think it's not something we would have thought of doing um, in the space to, to divide it up with these sort of landformed steps, but, um, but I think it works in a lot of ways. So on this side, there's a steeper um, set of steps or seating for watching festivals. And there's a smaller version over here. Here it's, it's more raked, it's a little more gentle and it's for, um, watching lectures and plays and performances and stuff um, on the other side. So here's the, here's the basketball side. And then you finally can see the beginnings of the, um, of the soccer field. So the other thing we did is um, used a lot of the, the land 
or the ground that we cut to make some of these spaces back here to then create um, sort of a landformed berm around the soccer field for seating and just noise and, and um, visual um, break, breaking it up so that you, you can't quite see into what's happening to control a little bit of, of what the experience is like to be inside of there. And we also, just like in the health center, we sort of extended this idea of, um, of, of using the project as a way to give back something other than just a job. So here you're seeing now, now it's become much more formalized, <laughs> this idea of, um, I guess, essentially catering every day at the job site. Um, so here you're seeing a number of the, of the lunches that are set out. And um, there, there's a, essentially we're, we're helping to create a couple of different, a couple of different industries there. So there's this, this whole like food um, infrastructure now that's, that's happening on the projects. Um, and this is sort of break time. So you're seeing everyone um, young and old, um, you know, like professional construction workers, along with people that are from the village that are doing other jobs. And this is sort of lunchtime. Um, let me show one more video. So one of the things we're doing with this, in addition to the bricks, is we've been introducing um, we've been introducing um, sta interlocking stabilized soil blocks. So blocks, here's a few of the shapes of them. Um, so blocks that are not fired. Um, so these are all compressed earth blocks. Um, and you're sort of seeing, this is another project, which I'm, it's a sort of an orphanage project that's using this um, construction technique a little bit. And we're just, these are a few clips from a de demonstration one of, the, one of our interns is doing. So this is the, a Makiga machine, which basically makes the, makes the block. And this is sort of how they're laid. They're sun-dried after they're compressed and then they're sort of laid in place. No mortar or other materials. This is a standard this is something you could you could buy a Makika machine right now off the internet for two thousand bucks, and you can make a, a building in your backyard this way. Um, so, so we're doing some work with that as another way of introducing a a different building different building methodology that has a lot less embedded energy in it, and it can be built for a much cheaper than a traditional brick now. It's not quite as durable, um, but considering the amount of money and energy put into the construction of these, it, it, it is quite durable. So the other thing we've been doing, and this is also with Autodesk, is um, taking apart those machines, those Makiga compression machines, that's, that's one manufacturer. There's a number of different manufacturers that make these. That's the one that just uses human power. You saw that guy like hanging off the edge of it, um, trying to get all his weight on it. Um, there's other ones that use um, hydraulic compression um, or even like gas powered compressors to, to do the same job. Um, so we've been working with uh, the, at least the hand, hand one uh, now or the manual, manual one um, to um, redesign certain brick shapes or, or let's say modular unit shapes so that we can get different, um, different forms. So like curves, different ways of interlocking bricks, but also to um, create different types of performance for the bricks. So ones that shed water in specific ways, ones that um, help break up uh, airflow or encourage airflow in different ways. Um, so ventilation is, is very important with a lot of the projects because they're not um, conditioned spaces. So, so air ventilation, air movement becomes very important, especially now with COVID thinking of ways in which we, um, we turn over the air the air exchange at a higher rate. So anyway, um, again, this is a sort of a investigation that's somewhat on hold until um, into the summer, but we've been actually redesigning a lot of these bricks um, with, in collaboration with Autodesk to think about how we can create different, um, different effects from that. Uh, and then again, using, using some of their robotic techniques to um, not mass produce, but mass test a lot of these configurations. The goal eventually being that we would fabricate a, a different type of mold that could fit into these machines um, to make a, a, different, a couple of different types of blocks. So, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, looking at this and then looking at that, one of the things I often have difficulty with personally 
is how do we merge, how do we take this, you know, these, these two ideas, these, this sort of bifurcated idea of practice, one that's very inward looking and that's, that's like stuff like this, and then one that's very outward looking, which is stuff like this, and how do they coexist or how do they become part of the same body of work? And it's not, it's not the easiest thing to do because in, in many ways they're very different worlds, right? They're like, when you go and talk to nonprofit people and you go talk to techno technologist design people, they just, it's like, a, it's like they're not speaking the same language. Um, and it's not that they're not interested in what each other's doing and, and think there's a lot of potential for overlap. Um, but so it's an interesting problem for us. And it's one we've dealt with for 10 years, um, trying to find ways in which those, those things fit together. But is um, that maybe the, the, I would say post 2008 and then now with uh, Corona as well, we've had these drastic transitions where it has forced architectural practices to think outside of the box on how to develop new structures of, of practice. So do you find that this is maybe the contemporary approach based on all of the, again, economical and health issues that are happening around the world that the architect is now becoming a composer that should know all of these other dimensions. Yeah, I mean, there is this strange pressure between, um, there's pressure to become ever more specialized and, and to, to have a deeper dive into these things that you do, um, which, which, you know, it, it, things become more and more esoteric. And, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean, they become just more and more like focused on these smaller and smaller scopes. So there's this, th there's that pressure. And then there's this other pressure to be a generalist, which is the, like you said, like the one that can, that knows a little bit about a lot of different things enough to the point that they can help to choreograph how those different things come together to make something bigger than any of those individual disciplines or, um, or specialties can do on their own, right? And but this, you're presenting and a model you're presenting a model where you can do both. You can develop that specialty or the specialized knowledge and also be the composer of uh, trying to set up a project that you have to organize all of these things, even the human component, and you bring in other um, contractors and specialists and consultants and all those other stuff. So it seems that you're, you're running a new model of a contemporary practice where you can do both. That would be the goal. I don't know that we do it very well, because <laughs> it's because it, they are a bit um, they are a bit opposed to each other. And um, you know, I, I love I really love teaching, but academia is not helpful in that manner because I think it, it tends toward to push you towards the the specialization, you know, the inward look. trajectory. What's that? The inward look. Yeah. So, well, I mean, or, or an outward look, but what, it, what it's not, and, and I, it makes sense that it's like that because if, you, if I'm taking a class on computational methods, I want someone that really knows this stuff, right? Because, so in a way that makes total sense that it would be that way. Right. Practice is often not, is, is, more, the, is more the generalist uh, approach. It needs to be more of the generalist approach because you have to juggle so many different constituencies technologies, considerations. So doing, doing both can be problematic in the sense that you always, uh, well, I'm, I'm speaking for myself now, I guess, but I always feel like I'm, I'm never giving either one the, the, the amount of attention that they need, that, that, that they deserve. Um, but the hope would be that there is a model of practice out there which allows you to be both broad and deep in, in these things. Um, but I mean, but you're also becoming an educator through GAC. I mean, especially when you're yeah. talking about all these, uh, the building of communities and teaching them how to be autonomous, even after you guys pull out, you have to implicate some teaching methods and simplify, or not, I don't know if simplify is the correct word, word but um, you have to teach them proper techniques based on the context on how they can develop their own architectural methods without saying this is an architecture class or with, I'm not gonna right. teach you architecture, I'm just gonna teach you how to produce something. 
Yeah, I think it's it's about making things accessible, you know, and accessible, but also not prescriptive. Because in the end of the at the end of the day, you know, if you're building, okay, for one, we're not Rwandan, so you know, our we'll never we'll never know what it's like to be Rwandan, right? It's ne it's never going to happen, right? Um, so we're always uh, an outsider, and that's fine. Um, but what that means is that there's a whole segment of the process of making a project that we'll, we will never really fully understand, right? Or we'll never fully experience as a Rwandan person. So I can, I can go there, I can learn what it is, I can live in Rwanda, I can learn what it is to live in Rwanda, what, it's, what life is like there, and I can get closer and closer to understanding it. But you always, I think for us, we have to leave a space for, the people we're working with to have a voice in the project because we because it's a it's a blind spot for us right you know yeah it'll always, sure. it'll always be a blind spot but so it also that's where yeah it's also an Sorry. opportunity to introduce something new based as a, um, as an outsider that you can view things that the locals are overseeing just because they see it every day it becomes you know mundane for them so they don't I think it happens everywhere where the, the space where you live, it just becomes the normal and you ignore it and you just live your life. And then an outsider comes and you can see things with a new perspective that might hint at a, a new way of understanding the local culture. Yeah. So I think uh, you guys operating in Rwanda, it's not that you're imposing something, as you mentioned, it's more of uh, you're bringing teaching techniques, but you can also extract all these things that you are seeing as, a, as an outsider and um, yeah, I think this is something that, that we've been having a conversation here in Seoul as well as uh, from, from all the foreign professors. What can you bring in that you're not imposing something on the local culture, yeah. but, and I, actually, sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you because we're going into this conversation, but um, was that the, well, I think, the last slide? Yeah, I think or? that's very true. I think it's very true. And, and you're right about being able to see things in a different way. I mean, when we started asking people to weave facades and, and things like that they're like what, what are you talking about like no this is this is for ba making baskets or this is for making you know these kind of like stretcher things that they had or whatever right and so yeah i mean we offer a different our our um ignorance or naiveness <laughs> right also allows you to see things in a different way because they become codified within a within a culture or within a place the same with here, like so. When, so, um, you know, one of the people we had working with us on a project, um, Billy, who who's now doing a PhD at MIT, he's Rwandan, and he and I actually met him when he was just starting at MIT, and it was great because he he could give us commentary about things we were doing in the U.S. in practice that we just well we just thought well this is the way we do it, and he was like well, why do you, you know why don't you do it this way? And we're like oh yeah why don't we do it with that? You know, so he could see things that I, I would never see because, you know, you just become so used to seeing or right. experiencing things a certain way. So you're, you're right. I think that is the, advan the advantage of not being within that culture is that you see it in a different way. And that could be, that could be very helpful. So um, is it okay to open up for uh, questions from, from everybody in the audience or? Um, sure. Was that the last slide? Yeah, this is the last one. So ah, okay, okay. I can so, keep it. So yeah, if anybody has questions, uh, feel free to um, to ask now. Because um, if not, we're going to go into monopolizing this conversation <laughs> between just the two of us. And it'll be interesting to hear if you, if any of you have any any comments or questions. So are you guys, uh, going back to my, the, the initial thought when I was uh, thinking that you guys start from the micro, which I, I was interpreting as material, um, but maybe, well, I like one phrase that you said about the procedural logic and the procedural logic goes both ways. You have to understand the material and then how to implement it to build the form. Mm -hmm. and 
if I think of it in terms of procedural logic and not in terms of material, it also explains a lot of the, the works that you're doing in, in, in Rwanda that, that contemporary projects be, that you're presenting, they're not like simple programmatic buildings, like even the, the health center, you're trying to hybridize them in order to end the stigma of something, right? So it's not a health center, it's a community center that offers health advice or health uh, services. Mm -hmm. Uh, they all become these, um, yeah, hybrids between institution, community, even though you, you start with a very, let's say, straightforward program, okay, we're going to do, you could start with, like, I'm going to do just a school, and then it ends up becoming um, all these sports facilities and extra stuff that, the, that builds up the community. So, I think understanding the procedure, either from the academic point of view or from the practical point of view, this procedural logic, I think it's it's a maybe a new way of that I, that I'm seeing your practice. That yeah, I think one, on one of the why, well, yep. One one of the things that we Sanana and I often look at is um, the question of how how did something become the way it is, right? So, um, not not what not what is it, but how did it become, right? It's like, so, um, and so I think that has a lot to do with this idea of phenomena or uh, like you said, procedural, procedural practices that have to go to the, um, to this question of that, it, it, is, it is a question of how, like how something is made, but it's also incorporates this idea of what, why something is made, the way, the way it is, right? And that, Th those procedures could be as simple as, you know, this is, if you're weaving something, you do it this way and then that way because it, because it comes together easier. Or um, in, in some of the insulate, the plastic installations that, um, that we were showing, a lot of the size of those pieces was very much calibrated to the fact that you had to connect it with your hand. So then, then the question became, okay, so all the openings had to be big enough to fit a hand through. And then I'm working with some students and I have some smaller students that have small hands and then, but then I have bigger, bigger hands. So now we're like figuring out what, how small can it be and how big can it be to like accommodate all these things. And so you, you find out that a lot of those formal, what seem to be formal um, constituencies within the, within, the, within the project or these formal tendencies actually fall back to something even more basic than that, which is that my hand is this big and I can't put it together if I can't get my hand in there, right? And so the idea that you would, <clears throat> and this is something that I, I, I really sort of believe in in teaching, which is that you, you can't, it can't only be a concept. It has, to, you also need to go through the process of making it because there's a lot of information that the project absorbs in the process of making it. At the same time, it can't just be about making something, right? Because then it's not, it's not really tethered to anything but that. So it also has to have this conceptual underpinning. So I think, you know, mixing those two, two things together, the, the how and the why, um, for, for me is, is very important. And I think, you know, there's, I showed some projects, a lot of these projects Annette and I worked on together. Um, the materials lab was much more her than, than me. Um, but she's done a lot more, and I didn't really feel comfortable presenting it, but she's been doing a lot more research um, into um, food systems and the materiality and the customs and the procedures behind food systems that we rely on. And I think her work is, in, in some ways, we're, we diverge um, but more, more, more so in the last few years than previously, um, but they still have that underpinning, I think, which is this idea of why and how simultaneously, because they don't, one doesn't answer the other, but, but neither of them by themselves answer the, you know, answer the question of why things become the way they do or <laughs> whatever that, whatever that question is. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think a lot of, a lot of our early stuff did start with materials, but it started to expand um, because someone or something has to put those materials to use or change them or manipulate them or process them or ingest them. 
right? So there's a there's another component there um, that we're sort of interested in, I think. What is the Actually, one thing that kept, I kept on thinking, because you kept on showing, okay, this is a project in Rwanda, now let's bring it to academia, and then now let's bring it into um, private research with Autodesk. What is the ultimate goal that you have? Because um, it seems, okay, you're doing this practical one and you learn something or you, you find some piece of, of uh, technology that you want to extract, and then you research it at your lab at the university. And then you expand it more specifically with, uh, let's say, the Autodesk uh, partnership. What would be the goal of um, after the Autodesk result, let's say? Like, is it bringing it back to the practical projects, or uh, how do you yeah, see it? Yeah, so the <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think that's ultimately the goal is to apply these. I think one of the things that's helpful for me, um, or for maybe both of us, is to um, to isolate some of those questions early on, um, so that they don't they don't become overwhelming. So for the for the um, for the compressed earth blocks, for instance, we sort of isolated that into just thinking about okay, how do we if we could change the form or the or the um, the chemical composition, how could we then improve certain performances? And the performances are coming from projects in Rwanda. So like I was saying, like water resistance. Um, seismic st or stability within seismic zones, um, ease of assembly, uh, ventilation, things like that, right? So they're kind of practical in a way, but, but the idea was to isolate those and to have them be a little bit more inward looking for a while until we understood some of the possibilities better and then to test those by applying them to a project. So, um, you know, we have a, quite a few um, JSC has quite a few projects in Rwanda. Uh, many of them are, are very small. Um, I just showed a, a few that I thought were important um, for us. But there's a lot of opportunities to test out, um, test out these things. So, uh, like you know, we're doing this small kitchen project where we're using uh, these modified compressed earth blocks um, as a way of testing because it's so small. We did a latrine with. Uh, or J Jamie did a latrine, got a grant and did a latrine project with locals to teach them different building technologies. And we were, in that case, we were look at, looking at uh, modifications to, um, to Adobe or sort of rammed earth processes. Um, and again, it's like, a, it's a very, it's the size of the room I'm in essentially is the, is the building. So you can, sort of, you can sort of test out those things, um, not unlike the earth bags. So that, you know, the earth bags project, we, there's a lot of things that we discovered in that. Uh, that we liked and that we didn't like about the way they performed and the way and the possibilities for their assembly. Um, and there's a lot of limitations. Like they don't work, they don't work so well in two-story buildings. They don't work so well in long spans. They don't work so well when you're trying to make a, a building that has a long straight wall, <laughs> right? Because there's a, so so it, you know it it helps us to understand some of the boundaries of these um, of these materials and techniques. Um, and then to consider, well, okay, well, what would we do next? What, what would we change for the next one? And so that's um, with definitely with the Autodesk work. Um, that's the goal. Is we, we have a number of projects that we're hoping to apply this research to, um, and we'll and we'll start small, and and then we'll build from there. So you know, one of the ones that's been really great is the is the um, the SCAT modified or uh, modern brick, the the Swiss research firm, working with them on on these has been really great because they've put in a lot of a lot of time and effort into understanding how these bricks perform, um, the, the variations that they have. And they performed really well and we've been able to use them on a couple different projects in different ways. Um, and even starting now with a with this orphanage project that we're working on, incorporating those bricks with compressed earth bricks for different applications or different um, creating di different um, I guess performance performances, uh, which is pretty interesting. I don't know that there's many places that have done that before. And you know, in, in a way, when you when you step back, if you're you know if you're 200 feet away from the building, it just looks kind of like a boxy building. You know, <laughs> mm. I mean, it doesn't. There's nothing outwardly, unlike the image that's on the screen. There's nothing outwardly evocative about it necessarily. Um, and I think we're okay with that. I, I think it it's. Um, you know, there's there's something nice about it performing in an unexpected way and not necessarily being formally 
intricate in some in some way. And so but then you know, like the like the thing on the screen, it's like sometimes you have to scratch that itch of doing something weird or experimental, you know. And you know, the inward, the, the a practice that looks inward allows you to do that. I think. But is that something that, um, like the formal exploration in the practical side, is that something that um, you find that you you should expand on? Or, um, I mean, you just mentioned that, okay, maybe it looks boxy and maybe it's fine. But um, I understand it more like, from the under from the explanation that you gave let's say from the earth bags that the way that they perform they don't allow for long spans and and it's it's a the stacking system which ends up becoming uh you know a platonic form it could it could be a cube it could be a cylinder yes. uh, but it has to be a platonic form so there's it's the form is part of the system it's yeah, an integral so. situation so i I find it quite um, beautiful that it is that, you know, let's say you, you say, okay, it looks boxy, but in a way it's, 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 a, it's a, the manifestation of the system. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, and I think there's a certain satisfaction that has with that. In fact, one of the biggest frustrations I think I have personally is not being able to make the projects more closely aligned to those to those key considerations, right? Which means they become kind of in a way more and more minimal. And yeah. I think what happens is you get you get feedback from people in the community and no, it looks too simple or it doesn't look sophisticated or Western enough or whatever the case may be. And trying to argue out of that is <laughs> can be difficult because I agree with you. I think there is a sort of um, there can be a certain beautifulness in the in, in its sort of purposeful application, and and I don't want to say yeah. utilitarian because I think there's a restrict there's a there's a sort of restraint to some of the projects that um, is hard to pull off. So I was just going to go back to this one real quick um, to to sort of talk about that point. So you know the the beginning of this project was a simple you know outside the programmatic and the community um, things that we were trying to develop was just a simple question that we had, which is how do we stop, how do we, how do we build on a slope, on a steep slope, and not create these very segregated spaces? So um, if you can see, let me see, I'll make this. So in this drawing here, there's this darker wall that's a little bit thicker than all the rest of them. Mm -hmm. So this is a, an existing retaining wall that is about three meters high. Well, no, it's about four meters high. And what happened is you have this building up here and then you have this building down here and they don't, they don't feel like they're part of the same space at all. They feel like they're, in fact, when you're in this building, you can barely see this building. So one of the questions was how do we, how do we stop that? Because that happens everywhere in Rwanda and it's you know, very practical reasons. You have to hold back the earth. So you build this giant retaining wall but what it does is it creates a discontinuity of experience and a discontinuity of space that if you're trying to build a, a, a center for a community, it, it doesn't really help, I think. So the, the project formally, the project started by, okay, can we just take that retaining wall, take that four meters and break it up into 20 pieces or whatever? So that's where we get these like these long horizontal lines so this is just that idea of breaking up. So you're not seeing the topographic lines on top of this, but um, that's just breaking up the topography into these smaller stepped pieces that as they get to the edge kind of bleed out into the existing topography. So they all kind of like taper into nothing. So that then became um, the sort of the foundation. So you're seeing them here, but they basically became the foundation for the building. So there's all these stone retaining walls, some, so it's fairly flat here. So they're pretty small. It gets more steep here. So they get pretty tall. And that's, so that's what's happening. This is actually one, two, three, and then here's four. So that's four retaining walls. One of them is matching up to the existing one. So it's, it's quite tall, but it's kind of hard to see, but there's like these little step backs and some, and some rails. And then in the plan, 
you know, there's a series of ramps that go through and then um, stairs that, that um, mitigate that. And then uh, again, a series of ramps here and then this zigzag ramp. And part of it was we wanted to introduce international standards for accessibility to the project. Mm. So, um, so it, it, it sort of forced uh, an idea of ramping into this, but then breaking up the breaking up the space, so it's not just like, like you know, like three hundred feet of ramp <laughs> to get to yeah. some something else, but it it becomes part of a sequence, um, and that's you know that's kind of that's the beginning of the at least formally that's the beginning of the project. It's just how do we make that simple thing happen, and you know it gets more it gets more complicated as we start you know playing with the program or this idea of introducing different roof typologies mm. um so, so it, it starts to break away but you know there's a sort of retention to that so all these all the walls that are aligned with retaining walls extend beyond the building um to sort of reinforce that that stepping um let's see if there's another image that... yeah so you're, you're terracing the entire site through architecture yeah so and landscape and even and even in the opposite direction like mitigating some of that so yeah i mean in some ways in some ways it would be nice to even strengthen that formally but the, you know but then you get these other considerations like protecting people from rain or sun that start to complicate the um the geometries but you know i think they start with these simple like these simple horizontal bands that you're seeing mm. and then and it, it, it is just a way of of mitigating the land. It just be, it came out of that one question. So yeah, I, I don't know. But I, it would be, but I would definitely. I mean, I tend to personally, I tend towards either very minimal or or very like. Right? <laughs> like but I, whatever. Either are. way, I I feel like it's not about I just want to make a crazy form. Instead, it's about I want to understand the system and then what forms can come out of that system because yeah, when you when I you look so. at the the digitally fabricated ones it's understanding the connections and the material and then you investigate what forms could be made with that system you're not going to make right. the let's say the 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 pavilion that or the the art installation that you did in in um, Cincinnati you're not going to make it out of earth bags for example right right so I think there's a there's a clarity in relationship between form and system, or one I think informs so. the other. Like, yeah, yeah. I was just going to go back to the original or the the intro. I thought it was coming up. Anyway, um, because that image is not a project. It's it's a project that we just been we've been working on for not that long, maybe six months but it's part of an, um, an exhibition, hopefully in the summer. So these are um, actually, hang on just a second. So they're, um, they're like photos of some of, I don't know if you can uh, see this, <laughs> some <laughs> of these things. So these are, um, these are things that Sonata I've been working on and um, I don't know how to describe it other than to say we've, we're taking climatological data about a place and um, spatial or formalizing it into an object, right? But is this so, like a, a, I mean, I mean it's, it's a very uh, zoomed in image, but I couldn't tell if this is 3D printed or it's a material that produces this effect or is it? Um, so, yeah, so this is 3D printed. Okay. Yeah, so this is 3D printed and you're seeing every one of the contours that are cut to make the to make the print runs, the print yeah. lines. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think th this project has been, and so the one I'm holding up has a has a much finer um, striation. So part of it is understanding the process that makes it and using that as a way of adding another level of articulate. Actually, it's I don't know how to describe it, but it's actually adding another <laughs> level of information. It's 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 information about the material process that you're reading, mm. on top of the formal logic, which is derived from just taking data sets of of, of climate um, climate information about different locations, and 
and creating an object out of them so that it becomes, it doesn't become a graph, it, it becomes spatialized in some way, right? So these are, these are just, these are experiments. We have not, obviously not gotten it to where we want it to be yet, but, um, but, but I think you're right. It's about understanding that system of both of the, the thing that you're investigating, but also the way in which it's being made, right? So this one, the image on the screen is leveraging that, that um, the material computation of 3D printing on top of the sort of form that's, that's put in there. The other one that I was showing is much smoother. So you don't get as much of that information. It, it, it's the higher resolution actually causes a lower amount of information from the material, if that makes sense, right? Yeah, um, and what is the, what is the, um, well, the goal out of this one, like it, is, is this something that it's gonna formalize into a larger scale? Is it a material scale or? You know, for right now, so Zanet and I have done a few exhibitions where we take um, information about landscapes or sites and try to understand it in a couple of different ways. And so this is just the latest, mm. not unlike those reciprocal artifact things, it's, it's sort of the latest experiment in that. Um, and I think it's a way of understanding, um, it's a way of creating spaces or ob spatial objects that is tied to um, some, some type of set of information, some, some set of information that, that we are interested in learning more about, right? So one might, okay, so if you're, if you're building a building and you're interested in climate change and you wanna, in, and you wanna import climate or you want to have climatological data affect the building there's a lot of typical ways in which that done that's done um, with like sort of analyzing uh, solar radiation thinking about how you might mitigate that through screening through um, or um, how you might mitigate changes in external temperature through building with thermal mass I mean, there's like a lot of proven ways of doing things that that kind of work to different degrees and I think we were just interested in taking the same components, the, the, same, the same set of information and seeing if there's something else that can be generated out of that. It's just a way of exploring those, those techniques of making, I guess. <laughs> and, and that's kind of like the end of it. Like, mm. it's just, it, again, it's like this kind of inward focus thing. Mm. The idea is that out of doing that, um, the things in and of themselves don't have a purpose beyond the fact that going through the process of making them, we are learning something about how one might use climatological data to inform something that's spatial, right? And, and that's like, that's the goal. The, the goal is like a process or an understanding, or like you, more like what you said a minute ago, like an understanding of a system than it is a specific object or a specific outcome. Mm. Specific is there any, outcome. Is there an interest in the, let's say, craft of uh, the vernacular and yeah. digitalizing that? Like, have, have you explored, for example, the, the, the exercises that you do with your students that you were showing? Um, I mean, you showed the RISD one uh, that, that um, yeah, you take them through a process and, and teach them an algorithmic um, system. But is this something that you have uh, tried or, or would like to do, let's say like in Rwanda that it, you still have the you know, practical hat on and you have to get this, uh, let's say community center or something more um, practical going on. But have you had the chance of exploring somewhat the same methodologies that you do in your class with the vernacular crafts? Yeah, but so with, I think- Using the, the local people, I mean, that you, you kind of give them rules and see how it ends up. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think so far, mostly it's them giving us rules, like them telling us <laughs> how things are made, which is great because, um, because there is, you know, these people that are weaving this, there are generations of knowledge that are in that object, right? Mm. Of things that work, things that don't work, things that we can try, things that we sh you know, we've tried 50 times and it, we can never get it to work, right? So a lot of times they're informing us 
And then, yeah, I think um, this, like this research into the wo woven, to these sort of more architectural scale woven structures is, mm -hmm. is our first real attempt at applying human knowledge and, and methodologies. It's not really even applying it. It's more like, how do we, how do we learn from that? So, okay. I think, you know, humans are great at exp experimenting and, and, and imagining, but we get bored really easily with repetitive things, right? Like, like it, it's fun to, to learn how to weave something and then to try something slightly different and then, okay, it fails, whatever. But that's, that's more interesting than making the exact same basket over and over and over, right? Mm -hmm. But robots, they don't care. They'll just make the same basket over and over or they'll make a new one every time and it doesn't matter to them. So the idea I think with working with Autodesk is how do we take that, that aspect of automated fabrication and use it as a way to test um, some ideas that we have or some ideas that some of the people in Rwanda that we work with have about things, but to test it in a way that we as humans would quickly get bored at doing, because you know maybe to test it, you gotta make 20 of them exactly the same to really know if it works. And we don't do, you know, we don't really do that so well, or, you know, it's not that we don't do it well, it's I think we don't care to do it, you know, it's, we'd rather do something else. So I think that's where the, I think that's where the overlap comes in. Um, but it's always bringing it back to your lab outside of the, let's say outside of the field condition in, in a more controlled environment. And then you understand the technology and, and um, the algorithmic way of thinking um, but yeah, I was wondering if, if you ever, when you're teaching the community, if you ever do exercises just as you would in, in school and, uh, you know. yeah, maybe and this is a good, this is a question for Jamie, I think, who's there on the ground, who does most of this. Mm. I think, um, we set up a lot. I, I hope maybe with thinking through some of the things, but he's really the one that does this experimentation and, um, yeah, and he's the he's in many ways he's the at least for for JC he's the educator as well. I mean, we, we work with we work with a number of students from Rwanda um, University of Rwanda who has just recently I would say maybe six years ago started an architecture program and actually I've gone there and given um, a few like tutorial lectures things like that and we we did some tests. We did this one class where we just tested uh, a lot of um, brick brick patterning to get different formal qualities. So we started off by making, I basically brought a suitcase to Rwanda filled with these tiny little wooden blocks. <laughs> um, and we just, we just like showed up and we, we talked about some things. I gave a lecture or whatever. And then we just started making stuff with this, right? Thinking through this idea of modularity and how, how adaptive or resilient it is or what its boundaries are. And after doing a number of experiments with that, we just went out to a, a construction site and with thousands of bricks and just started like laying bricks in different ways to figure out like what works, what doesn't work um, and did some experiments that way. And that was, that's really fun um, because I don't, I don't know what's gonna happen. The other thing that's really interesting is, and I think this is why I'm reluctant to, to consider robotics or, or automated fabrication as being able to replicate what humans do because I, for one, I don't think it's in what the people in Rwanda or any, anywhere in the US, in Korea, in wherever people are making things, they're not reducible to an algorithm, or at least not yet. I mean, we're not, we don't have that ability to, um, to account for all the variation and, you know, intuition that happens in, in making something. Um, so, so reducing it to an algorithm, I think is problematic, but but um, allowing the knowledge or trying to find a way that human knowledge gets translated in a very basic way to something that can be automated as a way of testing variation in a controlled environment to get closer to something, whatever that is, I think that's valuable. In, in the end, that whatever you come up with has to then, like, like you said, go back out into the field and get applied and see what happens when you're dealing with inconsistent materials or, or like non-standard materials or in the bricklaying thing, um, you know, 
in Rwanda, bricks, there's a lot of different ways in which bricks are made. There's only a few places that make very precise bricks that you might find in Europe or in the US or in, in Korea or in Japan or whatever the case may be. Um, and there are a lot of less expensive bricks that, are, that have a lot of variation, right? And so some system has to account for that. And that comes down to builders in Rwanda. They know, how to, they know how to lay bricks when the pile of bricks they're working with is like wildly inconsistent, right? They know how to like pick and choose and think about how this thing's gonna go together when I have one brick, brick that's like 20% smaller than the, than the last brick I just used, right? Right, so which the I machine think, wouldn't be able to to figure out. The machine would already require to have the pre pre made perfect brick, and, right. and uh, yeah. Or you know, the, even here in the U.S., because everything is so mechanized or or systematized, we couldn't even make a brick. We couldn't even make bricks with that much variation, you know, unless we made it by hand. But no one's going to make it by hand, right? Because mm. you need hundreds of thousands of these to test anything. So. Um, so it's like we can't we don't even have access to those those materials here right so the best i think the best we can do is to figure out within the range of within the range of um these more standardized pieces what what happens when we change you know variable one variable two variable three to understand the implications of that then to take it out and say okay th this this um this patterning or whatever the case may be works really well for this type of performance. So then we bring it out into the field and see, okay, what happens now when we layer that with the inconsistency of brick, with the difference in climate that's happening, you know, to, for time for things to cure or whatever. So the testing it in the, in the field, it's not like they, it's not like there's, um, I don't know that that's replicable or I don't know that we can replicate it in a lab. I think what we can do is use the lab for what it's good for. And then the site becomes a different type of lab, right? It becomes a, a different type of a different a lab of different variables that you can't replicate in, in this fabrication facility, for instance. So um, I think that's, that's the difficult part of it. Um, and this is, I think, true with anything that you try to do that is novel or in innovative or whatever is that it's just a ton of trial and error like you can't mm. and in the trial and error it could be being done by a robot or it could be uh, being done by an algorithm it could be being done by a human but it's still um, there's still this sort of moment where it can't be things can't be simulated they have to be um, they have to be tried at full scale and with real materials and I think right now there's not a way around that. And, and I'm okay with that. I think that's where you get really interesting, you know, that's where really interesting solutions emerge because you have to deal with something that you didn't expect. And now you have to come up with a solution for it and you're already halfway through the project so you can't redesign it. So now, you know, it's like you have to figure out something that works within in the system right. you've already started. Um, yeah, and I think that's where you get really interesting things. So for instance, the, um, I didn't show pictures of the doors on the Learning and Sports Center, but um, there's a series of doors throughout the, throughout the buildings that have, um, uh, again, a, a different kind of woven pattern on them um, as a way of creating a screening system. And we had thought that we were just gonna use um, grasses or jute mm -hmm. or something which we had used before. And we started you know, saying this to the people that were working on the project. And, Telling them what we wanted to do and you know what, what materials we wanted to use, and they're like, "What are you? What are you talking about? You, no one uses. No one would use jute for this. This doesn't make any sense." And we're like, "Well, what would you use?" And they're like, "Oh, you need this bark." So they like went out into the, like the, into the forest, like like right next door, and come back like a minute later with this with this bark off of the eucalyptus tree that or this you know certain part of the bark that you use to weave flatter surfaces and things like that. And we would never have known to use that. Um, and so th those are things that, you know, this trial and error thing, those are things that pe other people have tried and, and succeeded with or failed at. And, and so they know, you know, what, what will work in this condition, you know, of, of the materials that are available in that area, they, they know what's gonna work.
for this for this type of effect or this type of performance and we and we don't so do, do you see i mean right now you have uh, the bifurcated practice just explained as the gac and ulterior office but do you see this uh potential trifurcated or <laughs> i'd like for other... it to be not yeah <laughs> I'd like for it to be like, not bifurcated. You would see uh, the ultimate goal would be to just have one single condition. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think there's there there are reasons. So it goes back to this. But or have I think you guys, the beginning of the. I'm sorry. Have, have you, no, have you have you guys seen other sort of uh, bifurcations that could occur? Um, I don't know if like Saneta is looking more into the landscape side of, of, of things. I mean, you're mentioning food, but um, is that something that leads to a completely different thing that an ulterior office and, and GAC that yeah. also can contribute to the, the overall learning process? Like have yeah. you found some other niche that needs to be somehow explored or, or experimented separately from GAC and, and ulterior office? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I don't know about separately. I think, you know, in a lot of ways, ulterior office is a way of doing everything. Or is academia, that or is academia the third leg? Is maybe. The, the it's, too, it's getting to be too many legs. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe, maybe. Um, I mean, I think one of the things I, I try to do is to incorporate some of the things that are happening in, in, the, two off, in the two offices into teaching. Um, or vice versa, right? It happens the other way around too a lot, um, and I think that's partly an attempt to leverage some of the things we've learned, but it's also an attempt to stop the bifurcating, right? Because it because it becomes it becomes a bit um, distracting to. I mean, the bifurcation is 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 good in the sense that it allows you to focus on something, right? It's like, okay, these are all the things I'm interested in, but I can't do all those things simultaneously, so I'm going to just do this for a while in this direction and then this for a while. And sometimes they branch back together. Um, but um, yeah, but it's, it's more of like a self-preservation self kind of thing than, than a conscious decision. I think when I started with the title, my intention was to think through the bifurcation that happens between how we're trained and how we grow a practice, which uh, again, goes back to this idea of a lot of how and what mm. questions. But then I think as a, as a practice matures or you know, as you get past some of those questions, the, the question that is less asked or we're, we're less, not so less asked, we're less equipped to be able to address is the why, right? So I mean, this even happens in my own teaching. I'm teaching as uh, a undergraduate, um, studio this semester, and I've really pushed hard for students to think about why is it that they're doing what they are doing. But what I think are some the fact of the is, you, what are some of the answers that you're getting from your students? And you know, I think this the students now in the last few years are much more much more socially aware than even a few years ago, and I think they're much more. Um, interested in the why, the, the question. And some of the questions I'm getting are, you know, so the, the project we're doing right now is in Charlottesville, which has a history, um, like many American cities, has a history of, um, of treating people of different races or different economic classes very differently. Uh, and it manifests itself in the built environment. So, um, so you know, like, uh, certain areas of town have been wiped out and replaced by strip malls or whatever. And it was mandated by the government in the 1940s and 50s. And, you know, it, so, so I think for my, so, so we've sort of, the, the group of people I'm teaching with have introduced a lot of these, um, these histories and ideas and students are very receptive to thinking about, okay, if I'm gonna build something in this city it can't just be a beautiful, well-crafted building. It also has to do something else or address something else beyond, beyond its physical boundaries. 
And I don't know that I have a good answer for, for what exactly it should be addressing, especially in like a sophomore studio where, you know, they're just, they're just kind of getting up to speed. And then obviously now they're dealing with, you know, the pandemic and everything. Um, so, so it's a difficult question in that sense. I think it's, it's one that's more suited to upper level and graduate students where the how becomes, you have enough of the how as a foundation or the, or the what. And so the yeah. why can, 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 has room to breathe. One of the things I, I tell find, students and- I find that the why usually tends to lead to uh, a more, um, I don't wanna say a humanitarian approach, but um, you, you always tend to think of why are we doing this? Is it to make the city better, the environment better? These sort of questions. Have you found any answers to the why in a non-practical way? Like, could you have a why just for the fun of it kind of thing? Like, is, yeah, there a, is there I think a non-practical so. why? So, you know, I think the one thing that I was very um, adverse to when I was younger as a designer is to do something because it's just some cool shit. You know, it's yeah. like, um, sometimes I think you have to do that because, because you know, what makes something because we, you know, we can, we can, we can acad academicalize this or whatever. I mean, <laughs> what makes something cool? It's, or what makes you think something cool? I mean, there's like this sort of aesthetic and by aesthetic, I mean like pre-cognitive response that you have to mm -hmm. something, meaning, meaning you, you don't, you're not rationalizing its goodness or why you like it or, or what liking it means. It's, it's, um, it's almost involuntary or maybe it is completely involuntary. Maybe we've been and, programmed for it. Right, and exactly. So understanding that programming is, is, is interesting, but th that's a reaction. That's like a real reaction that people have. And it's a very human one because what I find interesting, maybe a cat doesn't find interesting. So it's not, it's not um, just biological it, or not mere, merely biological. It's also more specific than that. But so, so doing something because it's cool or because it's beautiful or because it's interesting or because it's, it's weird or because it feels uncomfortable, those are, those are also valid whys. But I think we don't acknowledge or we're less comfortable acknowledging that as a why. We, we, we might acknowledge it privately. I mean, obviously we, we do, right? Because we're right. designing a building we're making decisions You're like what is this what is the shape of it what is the facade what are the materials and some of those and not all those are rational they can't all be rational decisions because we don't we just we just don't work that way so some of those decisions are just because it i like it it looks cool or you know or it doesn't look cool and that's it's cool to not look cool now or whatever, <laughs> whatever right so that's also a why but it's a it's an un, it's an unacknowledged why i think and but but i think you know and at the same time that's Maybe that's not enough. I think that's a that's a why that becomes personal, which is fine. But I think as a responsibility as a designer, especially one, especially if it's an architect or landscape architect, where the where the projects have a, a much broader in, impact and they don't in, impact a specific person, but they impact you know groups of people. Um, that why has to be a bit bigger than that. Has to be a bit more. Does it be broader than that? It, it can be it the would, personal one, but it also needs to be something else, right? You would, uh, would you say that then going back actually to one of your early slides of the outward look versus the inward look that you could have a non-practical why if it's an inward looking um, situation, but an outward looking, um, well, if you have an outward looking problem, then the why should encompass more of these uh, practical solutions or, or practical um, philosophies. Maybe, yeah. I think in the I think all projects have both of those inward and outward looking um, trajectories. I think the f splitting them for me is a way of um, creating a hierarchy. So. If I if I if I'm working on a project with JC and the project and and I come to a point where I have to make a decision about something, and I'm not sure what the and it's not obvious what the what the answer is, then and then I think that's where the this trajectory comes into play, right? Mm. 
if if I'm making the decisions because I'm trying to have design affect the world, then that that kind of leads me down one path. And if the decisions are about how the world is affecting design, then that leads me down another path. And by having both of them, it allows me or to, to do both of them um, and to think of them as being together, but, but potentially separate, um, allows me to say, it's okay. It, it's okay that not every project is like humanitarian or, <laughs> or is for the good of others, right? Yeah. And, and so that's the in, the inward one because the inward one I think you know I think a lot about the early two, late nineties early two thousands or whatever when you know like um, I think of people like um, like Greg Lynn or something right like mm. doing all these blobby things that are kind of self referential mm. and um, and and a lot of the questions that came up well this is an architecture what does it have to do with the real world and blah blah blah. But I think that you know his work is extremely important because it's a necessary, it's necessary, especially in these early days, when something is is new, a, a way of working or a way of our envir an environment to work in, is sort of new and untested. There has to be this this there has to be people, uh, and projects that just kind of like, you know, push all the buttons. You know, it's like that they're testing. How how does architecture deal with this thing, this new this new way of working, this new way of thinking about things? Mm. How do we deal with it? And I think this sort of more internal focus is actually very helpful for that, right? Because it's a it's sort of a testing and experimentation that has a lot to do with how does the discipline deal with this thing. But at some point it has to then turn back out and, and say, okay, now that this is sort of like, has sort of spun around and, 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 and become mixed in with everything else that architecture or landscape architecture is, then now, now, now that's the time when the question is, okay, so then now what is it doing for the rest of the world, right? Or mm. for everything outside of architecture. But it, I don't think it can start there, you know? It, it's, a hard, it's hard to expect that, you know, we can, we can now make everything parametric. So how does this help poverty right it's like it needs time it needs time to to develop and and for designers to um to incorporate it and understand it before it can be directed to other things so i think both are necessary and both are very valid um and i, I think maybe the difference is by stating them this way it's just that we're explicit about both of them I think sometimes one or the other is kind of hidden, you know? I mean, I think, I think there's no such thing of, I mean, even if you're doing something just because it's cool, because of the way that we have been educated, there's always an intrinsic value to it that it will lead to the outward look. So even yeah. going to the, the Greg Ling example, even though from the outside, it may look like, what is this guy doing? It's, 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 it's just blobs in the 90s. Uh, yeah. But he might have the, the understanding of the historical referencing of how architecture is changing from a Cartesian two plane to a topological understanding of the world, a 3D volumetric understanding of the world and that these technologies allow us to explore these things. So I think it's something that maybe um, might seem inward but at the end, as you mentioned, it, it, it gets processed outwardly. Yeah, and yeah. doing things just because they're cool, I think we already have the intrinsic uh, reference or that we already have the background information to, even though you're exploring something to be cool, it will lead to mm -hmm. some, some application or some academic response or some pedagogical uh, reasoning or something. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with, I agree with that. It's, it's, um, you know, in, in, in the blob or in anything, it's like the answer, the thing that's produced doesn't, isn't trying to, or doesn't, or maybe isn't even trying to exhaust the question. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's not a full answer to that question. It's just, it's, it's a way of getting to the, the answer is like, you know, it takes 20 years or whatever. It's like that one project is not the answer. Right. It's just trying to get at an answer. Right. Among right. many, 
Um, right. But yeah, th- and I think that's what happens is that you, sometimes you see the blob or whatever, whatever it is we're, we're talking about. And we're trying to think, well, how does that answer this bigger, bigger question? And I think it, it's not, it, but it's not meant to answer all of that big question, right? Right. It's, that's is there impossible. a question so, that, that you yourself are trying to poke into, let's say the architectural community? Is there a, uh, a why that you have been itching to yeah. ask? I think the thing that comes that I come back to that's a concern it, for myself, but for, for architecture and, or design in general is, uh, is relevance, right? Like, mm. h- how are we being relevant? Um, and I think sometimes when we get too far down the road of the inward thing, which is, I think is valuable, but I think we, the, the relevance gets lost or at least everyone else that's not in architecture <laughs> doesn't see the relevance, right? And I think that's dangerous because if we think about and I don't mean dangerous in, like, in the sense that we're necessarily doing something bad or, or whatever, but dangerous in the sense that if you think about how many buildings are designed by architects now compared to you know, the, per- the percentage, it's, it, it seems to be less and less, right? It might be more builders or more contractors or more, or, or not, not necessarily designing, but or having like a bigger role in, in considering what goes into design. I think it shrinks. It, it shrinks yearly or something, and that's uh, that's a concern I have because I, um, you know, to go back to this thing we were talking about earlier about someone that can help choreograph all the different constituencies. I think without that, and that's that typically is the architect or the landscape architect now, um, in many ways. Uh, without ha- without that, I think a lot of things get lost, and a lot of those whys get lost, mm. and that's a. So I think for me, it's like, what are the ways in which we are being relevant? And sometimes that means making an argument for something that doesn't necessarily seem particularly relevant, but sometimes it means like uh, sort of doing a self-assessment and thinking about, well, is there something I could be doing differently? Or is there something I need to be responding to? And so, yeah, I I don't know. I don't know that that's a really good answer, but- um, But relevance, relevance is the key word. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay, so uh, let's just see if there's any uh, comments or, or last uh, questions because I saw somebody type in something. Um, Eliza, yeah, I would see you it. like to ask? Eliza? Yes, I uh, typed my little comment in the chat that was like, but do you want to say it or should we just read it? You can just say it casually if you want. I mean, yeah, with like earlier the um, conversation about the why for like more because it's cool. I do feel like sometimes in reviews, some professors like shoot down ideas and experimentations, even though it's like studio and university, because like it isn't adding much or like a specific practical why or even if it's like not taking away from it it's like suddenly something that we shouldn't do so yeah I think I mean in academia it's also tricky because each professor has a different upbringing or the educational background and maybe it's it's a um, a pedagogical question of how should we be teaching students or what would be the the a proper process of, of teaching um, that doesn't get asked as well. Uh, just how the question of why is not asked as much. I think um, an in, inward look at how we are teaching and what we should be getting out of teaching is also lacking as well. Like uh, I think uh, to that point, if you let a student experiment without having any practical condition, the, the professor should also understand what could be the value of that. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a, I think it's, a, it's valuable to ask um, in that way as well. Why are we yeah, teaching? I, How should we learn? I mean, I'll also say that, you know, because something's cool or interesting or strange or whatever, that, you know, there's actually quite a lot of, of writing about that. Um, like uh, 
you know, from the, um, from sort of the satisfaction of the grotesque to the, to theories of ornament and, you know, histories of the Baroque. And I mean, there's just a lot that you can get into right. that have to do with these issues of interest. And I mean, aesthetics is its own category, it's its own like, you know, category of philosophy. So I think it, it, those things are valid. I think what happens a lot of times, and I would agree with this actually, is that because it's cool is not enough. Right. It, it can be part of the answer or it can be part of the reason, but it's not enough to, to make a strong argument for why you would do something a certain way or have it be a certain way. And so I think, um, I think we can be more honest about the fact that part, part of a decision or some aspects of a design are based on these, are based on these um, more personal or more um, or less rational things. And I think that's fine, but there also has to be some other, um, some other drivers, some other considerations, some other whys that are being answered with the project. Otherwise it's that, not that a- The issue may come when the student does not have the, the language to respond to that or they don't have enough yeah. of, the, of the language. So let's say uh, a freshman or a sophomore, they have the feeling of doing something that looks cool and they have, they, they're still lacking the, the historical or referential background to, to explain with proper language of why this could be, aside from just being cool. But yeah, um, yeah I think it comes with time as well and, and reading and understanding all these references and making connections to build up your vocabulary to how to respond. Right. There, and I think you know, just, just being personal, because, architecture, landscape architecture, urban design, a lot of many different design disciplines are public disciplines, meaning that we put things out into the world for more than one person, right? So the, the ways in which or the reasons that we make certain decisions or go down certain pathways need also to consider that as part of the discipline, part of the project, right? part of the, the larger project of architecture or whatever the discipline is um, because they need to be responsive to things that are, they go beyond yourself, right? So, um, so it's a, you know, it's, it's a mixture. And I think you're right. Part of it is a vocabulary and part of it is, um, you know, like I was saying earlier, it's like, I, I was very wary to say things like that earlier on. And only now that I'm in my forties, <laughs> am I more comfortable <laughs> saying that, right? But you know that that also means that you know I, it's like twenty years since I've been in or whatever school, mm -hmm. not twenty years, fifteen years since I've been in school. So um, you know it, it takes time to be able to come to terms with that, but also to utilize that as a as something powerful in your design process, and not like a crutch or not a a sort of fallback position, right? It, it, it actually is something that can help drive something to be better. Um, so, so it's cool's good, but it's not enough. If that makes, if that yeah. makes sense. I, I'll also say this. I think that you know. I think one of the reasons. So I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm talking shit about the <laughs> how and the what, because the how and the what are very important, and here's why they're very important there's certain things you're going to want to express as a designer, certain issues that you want to address, whether it has to do with social injustice or climate change or whatever the case may be. And these are bigger, these are bigger issues. They go beyond yourself, they go beaxyond the discipline. Um, they, they are part of what it means to be human and things that we all should be considering and trying to address in what we do. But you'll find that I find that you'll quickly run out of an ability to express solutions or ideas about that if you don't know how to express them or, or what in what way you're going to express them, right? So, um, so for instance, you, you may have this great idea, but if you can't make a drawing or a rendering or a diagram or a collage or whatever it is that can then communicate that to others, if you don't have those sort of hows and whats 
to do that, then those things that you're concerned about start to not have an effect outside of yourself, right? They don't have a means to traverse the distance between my brain and your brain, right? Between my brain and that of the rest of the world, right? So I think those things are incredibly important. They're the means by which the why is answered. Um, I think, and so that's a lot, and, and so a lot of times that's why, you know, early, early on in, in your education, there's a big focus on how you do things and what you make. And I think slowly, you know, graduate school out, once you get onto practice and other things like that, the why can start to take over because you have a, you have a foundation in which you can start to express those, um, those concerns you have or those issues that you want to address. You have, you, you have a way of doing it. You have a, a method of doing it. Um, and obviously the, the method evolves and, and hopefully grows over time, um, but yeah. So, I don't know. All right. Well, we're going to conclude if there's any last uh, question or comment. Um, anybody that has a last uh, question? If not, uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, you skipped dinner, <laughs> I believe. And um, Hopefully next time also uh, Saneta can join, but it was great to have you and, and thank you so much for, for spending time with us and talking about all these issues that are, I think, uh, key for understanding the contemporary practice and the way that we should be looking at our architecture, even from the academic point of view and in school, as well as outside of school. So I appreciate your time. Thank you so much and uh, see you in- uh, Good morning. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> good, good afternoon. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry if I rambled a lot, but um, no, no, it was great. I, I think it was great to keep it as a conversation and then just have these uh, ideas back and forth, uh, rather than um, I think it was it was better to keep the flow going that way. So thank you so much. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Take care, guys. See All you. Right.